Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Almost hidden in the top left-hand corner of this painting, the artist Paul Gauguin has written in French these three questions. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Like many other people, I have puzzled over the nature of human existence for a long time. And my work as a documentary filmmaker has given me opportunities to consider these great mysteries from many different angles. And I've found increasingly that some of the most helpful and challenging contributions to my quest have come from the work of the Austrian philosopher and educationalist Rudolf Steiner. This film is about Steiner's life and about the work that his ideas and insights have inspired in all areas of human life. Ideas that challenge us to ponder on the true nature of the human being. In Gauguin's words, what are we? Steiner would probably add, and what might we become? Rudolf Steiner challenges us to be more conscious. More conscious and also, I think, to ground our consciousness in, in uh, the warmth of heart. And I, I, I feel one of the most important things about Steiner is actually that he encourages us to, to bring th thinking and, and feeling together, so head and heart together. I think Rudolf Steiner was a realist and a very practical person. I think he, he saw that he was planting seeds for the future. For me, meeting the work of Rudolf Steiner was like um, finding water in the desert because I had searched and searched for, through many different spiritual paths, very much in the East and also, also in the West including the spiritual path of modern science. I can't think of anybody else who simultaneously follows the whole uh, philosophical and scientific tradition uh, within the West and within modernity, studies it carefully, uh, it, it becomes uh, very competent in its different disciplines, and at the same time is a uh, is, is, is clearly a, a, a mystic. In one place, Rudolf Steiner said, if you would like to access higher wisdom, you have to unlearn everything that you have accumulated thus far. And to those of us with degrees and credentials and so on, it's a humbling moment. This notion of unlearning the conventional knowledge that is around us and being open in a kind of vulnerable place to a different way of seeing. Rudolf Steiner was ahead of his time during his time. And he's actually ahead of his time even in this time. You now he's been dead for almost 100 years. After a little time, I'll have half Q. If R is equal I think one of the greatest challenges that Rudolf Steiner zero. poses to us today is a challenge that he lived with in his own life namely the challenge to battle against sectarianism. Yes, he felt sorry because he wanted to help people, but he wanted more than this, he wanted to let them free. So that's, that's the essential point, it's the freedom. And you can help people and give them your own treasure, but finally they live out from your treasure and they are dependent. And that's the last thing Steiner wanted to have, dependent people. I think the challenge for me is to individualize what he has given. As he was in Norway, he almost always in his talks said, don't believe what I'm saying. 
you have to try it in life. Try it in life. And for me, that's my inner direction. I have to try it out and not just take it for granted. It is like this. And then life becomes so exciting. I think really Steiner is about love. But it's hard to get to that realization because of the so many thoughts. You know, so many thoughts. But when I think of him, I don't always think of the thoughts, though I'm impressed by them, of course. I think much more of this man, you know, traveling on drafty trains in the middle of the night to go to the next city to meet with, you know, nine people who are trying to figure something out or people just claw, scratching at him constantly for help. So he was a servant. So he wasn't a privileged person. He was a servant. So I think it's about love, really. Rudolf Steiner's influence, particularly through his indications about education, agriculture and medicine, is increasingly apparent. There are seven Rudolf Steiner Waldorf schools in India and over a thousand worldwide plus communities for those with learning difficulties, as well as hundreds of farmers working with his suggestions of how to not only produce healthier food, but also how to heal the earth in the process. Waldorf schools, biodynamic agriculture, the leader, Demeter, Hauschka, Camp Hill, these names are increasingly familiar all over the world. <laughs> In South India, I visited a group of small-scale farmers learning about the influence not just of the sun and the moon on plant growth and health, but also of the planets, a reminder of what in many parts of the world is still not totally forgotten. Rudolf Steiner shared this knowledge, in part based on traditional wisdom, in a course of lectures to farmers in Central Europe in 1924, a year before he died. An awareness of the influence of the planetary constellations, and including when you sow what, is also central to biodynamic agriculture a worldwide movement informed and inspired by that course of lectures delivered at a time when farmers were already expressing concern about the effect that chemical fertilizers were having on the soil and on the health and quality of their produce. The beauty of uh, Dr. Rudolf Steiner is that he was not just a philosopher living in a world of ideas and uh, just philosophizing and just thinking. He brought all these ideas to practical uh, human activity, whether it's agriculture, education, medicine, architecture. Jakes is president of the Biodynamic Association in India and has his own farm, but spends more and more of his time in China and Taiwan, as well as in India, helping small family farms to improve the quality of their land and crops and to survive financially in a culture that has increasingly encouraged farmers to use expensive pesticides and high-yielding, chemically dependent seeds. These seeds have to be purchased each year, bringing an end to the practice of farmers producing their own. Dependency on the multinationals has forced a huge number of Indian farmers into bankruptcy, and many even to suicide. Jakes went on to tell me how many of Steiner's philosophical and spiritual teachings, as well as their practical applications, felt very familiar to people in India, in particular the belief in reincarnation and karma. Where do we come from? Where are we going? Despite the many challenges and seeming setbacks that we may face, the idea that we live and learn and grow through many lifetimes is an ancient teaching. So too, that the universe is alive and has purpose and meaning. This awareness that there is more to reality than meets the eye was simply and imaginatively expressed to me 5,000 miles away from South India through an encounter at a biodynamic farm in England on the edge of the Ashdown Forest in Sussex. There's nothing nasty goes on these raspberries then, yeah? 
Nothing at all. Um, the only thing that we put on these raspberries are two preparations, um, something called 500 and 501. 500 is the horn manure preparation and 501 is the silica preparation. And they're sprayed at the beginning of the season and then when there's fruit coming. Is, is the whole thing about the sort of planets and raspberries, I mean, that obviously makes sense to you, does it? Does it make sense? Um, no, it doesn't make sense. But bringing in the forces of the whole of the cosmos and the whole of the universe absolutely makes sense. Um, I don't understand the minutiae of it and I don't need to understand. But what I need to really know and believe is that I'm not alone in this garden working to grow all this. And that's, that's for me, is what's important. Liz is in charge of the fruit and vegetables at Plaw Hatch Farm. Her sense that she's not alone echoes Steiner's many references to an invisible realm that supports and sustains not only the life of plants and animals, but humanity itself. What was very visible at Plohatch Farm on the day we filmed was a group of nine-year-olds from the Steiner Waldorf School in Brighton. Farming is one of the subjects on the curriculum for class three in all Steiner schools. In charge of the dairy herd at Plaw Hatch is Tom Ventham. For me, I've come into biodynamics quite late on in life. Okay, I was brought up in a very different way. And, um, but in agriculture? In agriculture, very much so. I brought up on a farm. And I've, I've uh, um, had a lot of inspiration from working in Africa. And it was while I was in Africa that I came across the whole biodynamic movement. And what it's done for me it's really encouraged me to look within myself and within the farm and uh, rather than look outwards because I think all through my life I've been sort of conditioned to look outwards and look at production and look at what's actually materially happening whereas what I've discovered is that if you actually look within and make sure that sits comfortably within oneself and within your heart then everything that comes out is going to be just fine and uh, I think that's what the whole biodynamic movement has meant to me. Um, it's changed me to look inwards. So you mean you're a better farmer as a result? Then? Yeah, but I've, I used to measure milk yields, but I don't now. It's a disaster. Because if you measure a milk yield, then you're thinking that actually um, that's a measure of success. It's not about milk yield. It's about the animal as a whole. And so it's changed the way I farm into a much more qualitative approach rather than the production approach. As with all biodynamic farms, Plaw Hatch is farmed organically, natural feed for the animals and no pesticides or artificial fertilizers on the land. And the emphasis is on diversity, not just cows, not just raspberries. There's also a cheese making operation at Plaw Hatch Farm, and as a community supported enterprise, they have over 600 loyal and committed customers who own shares in the venture. Plaw Hatch's milk and yogurt are sold in their farm shop, along with Lizzie's fruit and vegetables. I asked one of the apprentices what she made of Steiner's ideas. They're hugely far out. And it's very difficult to actually read a book that's written by Steiner. Everybody I've met struggles with it. And even when you can manage to, manage to read the book, to accept his ideas is, is another challenge as well, because, yes, some of them come across as quite loopy. And I don't think he wanted anybody to blindly accept what he was saying. I think you've got to try things out and just see if it fit, you know, sits well with you. And, um, and also adapt it. I think we need to be flexible as well. And, yeah, feel our way through the work, you know? Do we work with the preparation, spray the fields, and also personalise it, you know, put your own love into it at the end of the day. I don't think there's any point in just, like, reading the book and just using it like a manual. And he had some inspiring ideas, and, and it's quite difficult to understand why we spray the fields of these bizarre 
combinations of ingredients. But you give it a try, trust it, you know, have some faith that maybe it's going to help, and then see if it works. I think we've got to be open and, and flexible. To be open and flexible and to trust. A young Dutch apprentice is doing just that. For an hour, he will stir this substance, which contains a preparation known as 500, cow manure that has been buried in a cow horn for six months over the winter when the crystalline forces in the earth are at their strongest and therefore most receptive to cosmic influences. Through rhythmic stirring, so Steiner indicated, forces within the preparation are released into the water, which, when sprayed on the land, has a dynamic effect on the soil and therefore on plant growth. Cattle, along with pigs, sheep and poultry, are the focus at Tablehurst Farm, the sister enterprise to Plaw Hatch. Between them, they farm on 700 acres, most of which are held by a land trust and not privately owned, thereby guaranteeing long-term security. Steiner frequently warned against treating land and indeed capital and labour as a commodity. At Tablehurst and Plaw Hatch, they grow their own feed and produce enough manure and compost to fertilise both farms. The mixture of animals, crops, fruit and vegetables enhances, it seems, the health and well-being of the farm as a whole. Peter Brown is one of the farmers at Tablehurst. On biodynamic farms, cows keep their horns, which are seen as an important sense organ, helping to give each animal an awareness of its surroundings and of its own metabolism and identity. If a cow doesn't have its horns, it can't actually feel anything. It doesn't know who it is as an individual. And that's why most farmers take the horns off, so they can keep more animals in, but also it takes away the cow's sense of who she is. Then that cow won't mind standing so close to each other like that. But these cows, they need about two or three metres around each other. If anybody goes into that space, they don't like it at all. So they're very strong individuals. Look at Orchid here. Nobody's going to go near her. Even if we go near her, she wants to get out of the way. But that's a very nice thing. Because if, she, if she's nice and individual, she has a very good immune system because she knows who she is. She feels good about herself and she knows what she's doing. Nothing can really touch her. Nothing can go wrong with her. But if we take her horns off, it's a bit like having lobotomy. Suddenly she doesn't know who she is. Actually, she doesn't really care who she is. She's lost her, one of her major sense organs. And who cares? Who cares what I eat? Who cares who I stand next to? And in fact, I don't need to last very long. And that's how most of our dairy cows are today, just like that. Where she should go on until she's about 15 years old, easily. Very strong. Never use any drugs on her, never spray any chemicals on her at all. Never do anything to her. Maybe just trim her feet, and that's it. And she'll give very, very nice milk. Very strong milk, full of vitality. Clearly, Tom's cows are not going to tolerate being herded into conditions that treat them as pure milk-producing machines. And on the subject of their horns, it had already been explained to me in India how there exists a close connection between the complex digestive system of a cow and its horns, a memory of which is still retained in the horn even after the animal is no longer alive. Hence the use of horns as receptacles for the two biodynamic preparations 500 and 501. <coughs> At Tablehurst Farm, the 500 preparation, known as horn manure, having been stirred rhythmically for an hour, is now sprayed on the ground in spring and will continue to be applied during the summer. In the meantime, below the ground and throughout the summer, are buried another batch of horns containing powdered silica. This substance, the preparation known as 501 or horn silica, is likewise stirred and then sprayed over the growing crops to regulate their receptivity to light and thereby improve their health, quality and vitality. In a nearby field, chamomile flowers are being picked by Peter Brown and his team. Chamomile is one of six plants, each carrying a particular function that is specially prepared and then introduced into the compost heaps 
along with nettles, oak bark, yarrow, dandelion and valerian, to enhance and regulate the process of fermentation. Yeah, well, we're happy after these three months of drought, aren't we? Yeah. A drought, yeah, oh yeah. Even the rye behind us is not as high as it should be, is it? That's because of the drought. There are 12 people employed on Tablehurst Farm, plus three apprentices and three people with learning difficulties. I asked Peter Brown about the viability of biodynamic agriculture. We, we, we're doing quite a lot of processing our products um, and selling direct to the customer. And, um, and, and that is what helps make it viable and it also gets a direct um, relationship with the, with the customer and, 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 and us as a group of farmers. And, um, and because we're doing the extra processing together with the farming, like we, we butcher the meat and sell it on the farm, and we make the wheat or the, or the rye in, into flour, and we sell it to the local bakery, and that sort of doubles the price. It's ironic because, you know, you, there's so much proportionally it feels like there's a lot of work goes into producing it, and then all you do is put it through the mill and, and you double your price. But that, so that's what you have to do, though, to make it viable. Driving the tractor is David Junghans. He attended a Steiner Waldorf school in his native Germany, then trained in conventional agriculture before coming to England to Emerson College to study biodynamics. I asked him what he understood by this word force, the idea that there is something invisible at work in the substances that make up the phenomenal world. I think everyone has uh, the experience of forces, hard forces, uh, of love, for example, or of any kind of emotions. Um, and, but you, they are not visible. It's only the physical car carrier, actually, the human being, that makes it visible. And so it is in nature. Potassium is a carrier for a particular force, and, and so on and so on. So that's how I understand forces. Forces stand behind matter and actually uh, matter carries these forces into the physical world. During my visit to what was clearly a thriving and truly mixed farm enterprise, someone remarked that old MacDonald seems to have got it right. Class one at the South Devon Rudolf Steiner School. Only now, age six to seven, are the children starting formally to learn to read and write. And like much of the teaching in Steiner schools, music and art are incorporated into the lessons throughout childhood. The South Devon School is one of 35 Steiner Waldorf schools in Britain. The first Waldorf School was founded by Steiner in 1919 at the request of Emil Molt, owner of the Waldorf Cigarette Factory in Stuttgart, who wanted an education for the children of his employees that prepared them for life in its fullest sense. And life in its fullest sense means educating hands and heart as well as head. Until the children go into class one around the age of seven, the emphasis is on play, imitation and on rhythm. Baking on Monday, painting on Wednesday, an expedition on Thursday and so on. And on stories which are told rather than read by the teacher. And Steiner's picture of child development is not only of children growing up and thereby learning the ways of the world, but also of children growing down bringing into life their own unique biographies, as he saw it from many lifetimes. And this needs time, time to build a strong and firm foundation so that each child can not only then face the world as it is, but also develop the strength of character to maybe change it.
Songs and ring games are another important ingredient in the early years. Ideally, dexterity in their bodies will gradually translate into dexterity in how they think and create. Much of what the children do, not just in the kindergarten, is designed to counteract what is increasingly recognized in the modern world as an erosion of childhood, a concern that extends far beyond the Waldorf school movement. As at the Breitensteiner School, these nine-year-olds are also not just studying farming, but actually doing it as part of what is called main lesson. One particular subject taught for the first two hours every morning over a period of three or four weeks. Around this age, most children start to take a new interest in the world around them, whilst also experiencing a certain separation from that world. Now they begin to study science, and in mathematics, the concept of fractions. Still waiting for signs. Now, who remembers which are those potatoes from the ones we planted? Are they early? early? Only early? <laughs> Lily? First early. First early, thank you. What else have we got here? Main crop. Main crop? Yeah, what else? Lily me. Early the second. Phrase that differently? Second early. Thank you. Who can show me blight in this pocket? Lily, show something to me. Can you see? I can see from where I am. Quite right. Yeah? Every digger should have two are the ones working together. So should be groups of three. A digger and two collecting the potatoes. The plants should all be brought, brought back here, please. Yeah, girls? That's perfect. No, that's fine. So one on this side. Um, you are too many here. Well, they really seem to be enjoying themselves. I thought children weren't meant to like gardening. <laughs> They, 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 they like gardening very much because they can see the end result. So they've been involved in the ploughing of this field, well, spreading the muck, uh, the ploughing of the field, which was done by horses. So they actually pulled the plough. So they had, what is that? When can we see the lamb? Soon. Yeah? How many? Seven. Very gentle. Nine. Whoa, wow, look at that. They respond very well to the activities we propose. Uh, it's the practical ones there. Really. Yes, let's do it. And there's a real enthusiasm that comes from them. Where are you from? I'm from Brazil. Brazil. Okay, yeah. from Brazil, yeah. So there are world of schools in Brazil, too. There are world of schools in Brazil. Yeah. But I wasn't connected uh, to schools there. I was connected to the biodynamic impulse, yeah. but not to schools. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're doing both. Yeah. That's right, yeah, sort of bringing them together, really. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Andre is also helping this class to build a stall from which they can sell the vegetables. Building is another subject taught at this age. Planning, measuring and execution. The curriculum in Steiner schools is designed to introduce subjects when they resonate and correspond to where the child is at in his or her development. Insight into what you teach when and a recognition of distinct seven-year phases in child development were two of Steiner's special contributions to education. No. What is the introduction? Um, that's to support, that's to attach the two poles together to make them both steady. Yeah, and what else? Uh, Jude? Um, also, so when we put the roof on, you don't have to put it exactly on the top of the pole, we can put it on the side bit. Does it hold up the roof? Well, it will. Like Jude said, what will be sitting here? 
But not all teaching in Steiner schools takes place outdoors. Biology is the main lesson subject for class six for the next three weeks. From class one to eight, the children who are unstreamed have the same teacher for these main lesson subjects, whether it be science, history, mathematics or geography. These key subjects form the core of the Waldorf curriculum. How does the queen ant start to establish her colony after she's mated with the drone on her nuptial flight? Aggie. She like digs a hole and then carries all the earth out of the hole so she can have more space to dig. Excellent, thank you. Alexa Smith will stay with this group of children until they go into the upper school around the age of 15. This can mean the children having the same class teacher for eight years, ideally creating a bond between teacher and pupils that goes way beyond the actual knowledge imparted. For the rest of the school day, the children will be taught by specialist teachers, languages, games, crafts, etc. I asked the teacher of class two what attracted parents to their school. Well, I think, I think there are an awful lot of parents who um, come to our schools and sense that what's there is, is wholesome and good for the children. And, 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 and they're looking for you know, childhood with all the light and joy that childhood brings. And quite often seeing in, in many schools that, that children in a way trying to be molded into something which isn't child friendly. And they see that in our schools you know, we celebrate childhood and we try to bring things which actually really nurture and nourish and feed where the children are actually at. And so they'll see that, they'll sense that, and then they bring their children and I think it's up to us to, to, to make what we do available and understandable in terms which don't make people feel that it's something weird that's behind it. Because I, I firmly, firmly believe it is not something weird. The sun with loving light makes bright for me each day. The soul with spirit power gives strength unto my veins. I've been doing this for 20 years and it, it's it really, really does nurture and nourish those children, and they are free afterwards. They're not, they're not coming out having to believe in any particular belief system or anything. They're totally free, but they've been nourished as human beings. Ian Powell teaches art and the history of art as well as drama to the upper school. Although there tend to be no internal exams in Steiner Waldorf schools, the pupils do take state examinations. I asked Ian about the word results, a label that is increasingly associated with a school's performance and success. For me, there's no such thing. I mean, one of the frustrations, if you think about that as a frustration, is that I will never see the results of my work until they come back to me when they're at least over 35 or 42. Um, and that's from a strong belief that they are continually growing. I mean, to think that a young person is only a summation of the results of, if it's GCSEs or A-levels or even a degree, if that's all that the person is, that, that really is a very slight on the individual, because we all know that, in fact, you're still developing. So I'm really well aware that anything I do here, if it's an examinable, is purely to allow them to go on to the next phase of study. It has nothing to do with the result. And again, time. Victor! How'd you come? Bobby! Oh. I then asked Ian how he related, as a teacher, to what Steiner said and wrote about karma and reincarnation. I think subliminally, as a teacher, when, you, when you've been working long enough, um, I think what starts to happen is you realise there's more to this young person than just the face value that you're seeing or the what can become. There's something that they're bringing with them. Yes, there's hereditary. That's, that's true, too. There's, there's the, the family, there's their society. But there's something else, and you become aware of there's something else very often. Uh, one doesn't look at it or dwell on it or try to research it because it's not within our remit to do so. But you're certainly aware that there's another tool, there's another something there that's happening that needs resolution or needs to be resolved, or that you allow the young person to perceive through doing the activities that we do. 
Um, they don't see it as karma, of course, but maybe when they're 35, 42, something might happen in their lives that they think, ah, oh, I was dealing with something that I had to work out at that age, even though I didn't know it. The school's doctor is James Dyson. In addition to his orthodox medical qualifications, he has made an in-depth study of Steiner's medically related lectures and writings, and of the considerable research that these insights have inspired into a greater understanding of the human being. In Gauguin's words, what are we? I asked James how these other perspectives informed his work as a doctor. Well, that's a big question, isn't yeah. it? Well, ju uh, just looking out of the window just now, what I was particularly interested in was looking, was observing movement, how children move. And I think that's as good a place to start as any, because movement can, movement speaks the language, not just, not just in the ordinary neurological sense, but, but movement and gesture speak the language of the soul, they speak the language of development, they, they show us how a child is relating to the environment, for instance. And nowadays, particularly, harmonious movement is often the exception rather than the rule. And why is this happening? I think that young children nowadays are subject to a far higher level of sensory stimulation than they were in the past, from a much earlier age. Be it, be it in the form of IT and screens, um, or, or, or in, in other ways too. And at the same time, children are deprived of the kind of traditional possibilities of movement through which, you know, your average child was exposed 30, 40, 50 years ago. Waldorf schools are almost unique in not introducing computers until the upper school, and then only gradually. Many parents and educationalists these days share their view that early childhood should be less focused on information technology and generally less pressured. The key theme of what Steiner brought as a, as a picture for child development, namely that up until neurological maturity has reached a certain level, you know, in the, in the sixth, seventh year of, of life, you should not tax the nervous system cognitively, but you should work very much with the faculty of imitation and creative play and stimulate that. And, and, what, and for what reason? Why shouldn't you tax the, the brain? <laughs> I mean, that's what you're talking about, isn't it? I think the simplest way of putting it is that if you're still laying the tracks for the, tram, for the tram line, you don't drive the tram along. Rudolf Steiner himself grew up beside railway lines. His father was a station master, and the exciting new world of trains was ever present. Steiner was two years old when, in 1863, his father was transferred to this station at Potschach in Lower Austria. He lived here until he was eight. Steiner wrote in his autobiography of his deep appreciation for the unspoiled landscape in which he grew up. Despite the new technology on his doorstep, life for the young boy was essentially simple. Simple, but far from cosy. Here, Steiner lived not only in the two worlds of trains and nature, both of which he loved, but also in an inner world of spiritual experiences that were as real to him as the physical world around him. Already around the age of seven, he had a vivid experience of a relative who had just committed suicide and who asked him for help. But it was to be almost 40 years before he could speak openly about such matters. What is the true nature of reality? Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? These were questions that were to occupy Rudolf Steiner for the rest of his life. In 1868, the family moved nearer to Vienna, to the village of Neudorf. 
By now, Steiner had a younger brother and sister. Though less remote than Potschach, his home was still, in Steiner's words, austere but healthy. He served as an altar boy at the local Catholic church, helped grow vegetables for the family, but the essence of his journey through childhood and youth, that long walk to school, was the story of a very bright but essentially lonely child, nudged by his father to study science and technology to qualify as an engineer on the railways, who was nevertheless thinking deeply about what he called the enigmas of existence, and already at the age of 14 studying the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. In 1879, at the age of 18, he passed his school leaving examination with distinction. For three years he'd given private tuition to fellow pupils in order, he wrote, to contribute at least a little of what my parents had to pay out of their meagre income for my schooling. And having attended a technical rather than a grammar school, he had had to teach himself Latin and Greek. From the Austrian countryside in which Steiner had grown up as the son of a humble railway official, the move to Vienna was a huge step. Capital of the vast Habsburg Empire, it was a cosmopolitan city buzzing with life, creativity and philosophical debate. A cultural flowering on a massive scale. In the autumn of that same year, Steiner enrolled at the Technical University to study biology, chemistry, physics and mathematics. But already his interests were as much in German philosophy and literature as in science. Very soon his social life began to flourish. The famous Café Greensteidel, which for a time he gave as his address, is now more a tourist attraction than a hive of philosophical debate. But round the corner at this nearby coffee house, it is easier to imagine the atmosphere of that era and the extraordinary variety of people with whom the young Steiner was mixing. Poets, rich merchants, Cistercian monks, feminists, university professors and poor students like himself. I asked two young customers, both of whom knew something about Steiner's life and legacy, whether the sort of discussions that Steiner and others had in coffee houses like this one were a thing of the past. Those dialogues really to sit hours and hours, yeah, and to develop an idea. I think you can't find that in, in that way anymore. Do you think that's sad? In a way, yes, because I'm old-fashioned. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm, I'm quite open to, to new ways of, of dialogues. And, yeah. and I think especially the communication through the net is an enormous, enormous chance, yeah? Opportunity, yeah. Opportunity, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're optimistic about the future in that sense, are you? I'm very optimistic, yeah? Yeah. And to me, uh, the idea it's, it's always a question, how would Steiner act uh, in, in those days? Yeah? Would he use the internet or not? I think he would. Yes, definitely. Yeah. He would be very, very open to our ways and our chances and our opportunities to communicate, to develop, to work together. Not everyone interested in Steiner's work would agree with Bipper about Steiner and the internet. Not only because he, like many others, recognized that technological advances ever since the printing press were no replacement for face-to-face -face human encounters, but also that the mindset behind such devices could, if we remain unconscious, take us on a slippery slope in which our entire world gradually becomes dehumanized. What Steiner made clear, however, is that all such decisions have finally to rest with the individual. His main message, especially to me, um, was or is uh, that he wants us to stand up um, for our own ideas. And that's, especially in our uh, time, not that easy. 
So for people, it's, it's much more easy to put him into a box than to focus his message and follow the message. And I think he didn't want us to follow him. He wanted us to follow ourselves. Although Steiner had an increasingly wide circle of friends, he was at the same time following his own inner voice. But, like all of us, he needed his awakeners, people who actually change your life. On his regular train journey from home into Vienna, he met such a person, a man with whom he could at last share his inner life of spiritual experiences. Felix Koguski was a herbalist who traveled into Vienna to sell to apothecaries the medicinal herbs he'd gathered in the countryside. On his back, wrote Steiner in his autobiography, were his bundles of herbs, but in his heart was the knowledge of the spiritual aspects of nature that had come to him through gathering them. Through Felix, Steiner learned that there existed a vast store of traditional wisdom that was soon to disappear completely from the folk culture of Central Europe. In his company, Steiner felt in touch with what he called a soul from ancient times, someone with the intuitive knowledge that he himself had experienced since childhood and which he was already trying to understand and above all to anchor in the world of modern day consciousness. But there was another ingredient that Steiner was to increasingly emphasize. For every step that we take in our search for this deeper wisdom, we need to take three steps in our moral development. A person should not be on this journey, he wrote some 25 years later, to accumulate learning as one's own treasure of knowledge, but in order to place this learning in the service of the world. Meanwhile, the young Steiner was to experience another great awakener, a man who was also to profoundly influence the course of his life. Among the great personalities of the German-speaking world, both past and present, he became inspired by the work of the literary giant Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who had died some 50 years earlier. Not Goethe just as poet and novelist, but Goethe as scientist, particularly his work in anatomy, optics and botany. Later, Steiner was to call him the Copernicus and the Kepler of the organic world. Goethe was a huge influence on Steiner, and, and Steiner felt that he discovered um, a kindred spirit in, in Goethe, because he was approaching the natural world with, a, a, with an open heart, and not as an object to be... Uh, studied and measured and quantified, but rather as a world that was still imbued with something sacred. I think Goethe was very aware of the sacredness of nature, and that's why he wanted to approach it in a different way, with, with empathy, rather than with objectifying consciousness. That's... But he still thought of himself as a scientist, didn't he, Goethe? He certainly did, because he was interested in, in knowledge, and in a, in a type of knowledge that was a direct knowing, really a perceiving, to actually see into the spiritual um, workings of nature. So he was focused much more on the world of qualities than of quantities, and much more on what could be perceived by each person as a, as a, a human being unaided by any scientific instruments. So for him, scientific instruments tended to get in the way of really seeing what was living in nature. That's why he's so much at odds with uh, the approach of mainstream science. Jeremy Nadler is a writer with a doctorate in theology and religious studies who makes his living as a gardener in Oxford. For Goethe, the, the human being is the most exact instrument. If you can develop that instrument into a, a, an organ of, of 
uh, deep perception, then of course you'll, you'll see more and more in nature, and that's what Steinop was able to do. He, he developed himself as a, of a, 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 as a, a, a spiritual instrument, I suppose. So he was perceiving much more than most people are able to perceive in the natural world. And he extended that to, to invisible worlds, of course. And was, was, was pointing to the fact that we all have this potential then. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not so easy to develop it, though. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, one just has to keep working at it, really on a daily basis. What, what is your understanding of the key to working with it then? Well, when I go into the gardens, I, I'm very aware that the first thing I, I want to do is and I see weeds and, you know, and I, I see all sorts of things that need doing. So I want to get engaged with practical stuff. But I try to stop myself and just spend at least a few minutes with a plant and just observe it, just be with it. And there's something immensely centering and healing in, in doing that. And I, I feel... It actually helps the rest of my, my day in the garden. You realise that there's a miracle there, really. And it's so easy to not see it. Yeah. But that would be true, perhaps, of life altogether. We just simply don't notice things, do we? We take things for granted. Yeah. Not just plants. That's absolutely true of life altogether. And, and one of the wonderful things about Goethe's scientific method is that you can apply it to every life situation. It's not just to do with our relationship to nature. It's not just um, to do with looking at plants or whatever. It's um, to do with how you relate to people, having an openness of, of heart, really. Goethe does provide a kind of transition, a, a, a foundation for a transition between, I might say, conventional day consciousness and what Steiner calls ultimately his spiritual science. That is to say, a, a way of engaging the world of uh, spirit, the world of our own inner experiences, with as much surety and, and clarity as we do the outer world. I'm going to remind you of what we saw at the very beginning of our class. Remember, there was a little Wimshurst machine here that allows us to do something very similar, slightly different geometry, but basically... A Arthur Zients is an American professor of physics at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Alongside his interest in Steiner, and through his connection with the work of the Dalai Lama, he is a pioneer in bringing the practice of meditation into academic circles. I asked Arthur to explain the young Steiner's interest in the philosopher Immanuel Kant, and in particular Steiner's rejection of Kant's hugely influential utterances on the limits to knowledge. The limits, the so-called limits to knowledge, are really the limits of a horizon. You know, if you stand on a mountaintop, you see further than if you're down in the valley. Well, but you've got to get to the mountaintop, right? So yes, you could say there are limits to knowledge if you're in a particular location, but there's nothing to keep you from developing yourself to a higher extent, it's like climbing the mountain, and seeing further. There'll still be a horizon, so you'll still experience a, a limit, but the limit is a subjective limit, not an objective statement about the way the world is organized. So, yes, you could say Steiner recognized that there are, in the moment, certain limits to knowledge, but that these are not part of our human nature. Human nature is, in some ways, inexhaustible. Everything that can be known can be known by the human being. We are, in that sense, in the image of God. We are filled with the potential for the most profound and extraordinary way of knowing. From Steiner's point of view, a human being stands in the world and the world's impressions come through the senses, green, movement, 
light, warmth, hardness, all that sort of stuff. And that's given to us. We don't do anything about that. I don't create that tree. The tree is all given there. But I, as a human being, also act into it because I bring the concept tree, green, the relationship of that tree, the kind of tree that is related to that another tree and so on. All that is a human product in relationship to what's given to me. So you have a given world and a world that's a product of human thinking. And these two interacting give us what we call the real world. So it isn't a world we can never know. It's not always immediately known, but it's not in its essence unknowable. I looked at it more carefully and then saw in its leaves it does something incredible. That the lower leaves are long stalked and kidney shaped and they, they form a little rosette. There are only three of them still alive. There were more earlier on. Then a little ways up the main stem you have the next leaf which also has a long stalk but is already in its blade. Craig Holdridge has also had a long interest in Steiner and threw Steiner into the work of Goethe. In upstate New York, he has founded the Nature Institute, where observation, the kind of meditative observation that Steiner practiced over many years, is explored. We founded the Nature Institute with the um, intention of having a place that can cultivate a particular way of knowing that can bring us back more in relationship with nature and the things themselves. And now that sounds, you know, very harmless and simple and maybe not even that important, but if you think about how strongly our culture and our minds are captivated with certain kind of abstract ideas, and we notice that people come to us with many, many abstractions in their minds about what hormones do, about what the brain does, about how nat natural selection has made us this way or that way. And we have all these explanations of the world, but do we see the world? Do we experience the world anymore? And of course, with our technologically dominated culture, this is, becomes more and more an issue. Goethe said something like, um, if we want to gain a living understanding of nature, we must make ourselves as mobile and flexible as nature herself. So science as transformation of the human being to understand the living character of the world. That's the mission of the Nature Institute. When Steiner came across Goethe's work, when he was, he was still a student at the University in Vienna, what he found in Goethe, what stimulated him in Goethe, was that here was a man who really immersed himself in the phenomenal world, didn't have lots of abstract concepts, and thereby opened himself to seeing relationships that um, spoke of more than the mere physical. It's, it is just unfortunate today that we, we are so, so much in a dualistic culture, you know, matter and mind, soul, and, or body and spirit, um, if we even think about the one half, right? But if, if we do think about the spiritual or the soul or whatever, then it's always in contrast to the body or this. That, that, but to see a unified world, and that was really Steiner in his epistemology based on Goethe, was all about the one world that we live in. It is one world, and we are part of one world. And there aren't two or three or fifty. There might be um, nuances and different levels, or whatever you want to call them, um, different uh, aspects that one can gain access to. But it is one manifoldly differentiated world. In this ap approach to understanding the world, you really do have to slow down. I mean, and that part of our challenge today is our rushed world, right? We rush from one thing to the next. And thereby, we can't really take anything in and meet it in any depth. And so, just to sit down and perceive and take the time to look at a plant or look at one leaf of one plant for five minutes, you know, it takes a lot today. 
and to take it in and say, what do you have to show me? And then the work continues. But you've slowed down and you've gone out and taken the time to take in something that the world has to offer you. And you, and it gives it a moment of quiet and a moment where you can really enter into a conversation with the world. So I've, you know, sometimes thought about, you know, this methodology or this aspect of the methodology that it would be interesting to speak of, like one speaks of slow food today and slow money, to speak of slow science. We need to slow down so that we can really dwell in the things as a basis of a more, <clears throat> as, as the basis of a deeper understanding of the world. Towards each other, too, then. Yes. I mean, in all respects, I speak mainly about, when I'm speaking about nature, I'm also speaking about my fellow human beings, right? In all our relationships, this, you know, taking the time. One set of relationships that Steiner had while still studying in Vienna, and which was to have far-reaching consequences, took place in this building, the home of the Specht family. Steiner tutored the four boys during his last six years in Vienna, while at the same time studying and writing on Goethe. Of particular concern to his parents was Otto, ten years old when Steiner first met him and considered by everyone as both physically and mentally abnormal and therefore uneducable. With Steiner's help, Otto's condition gradually improved and eventually he became a doctor. There is now a whole movement for therapeutic education with schools and villages not only here on the banks of the Severn Estuary in England but all over the world, a movement inspired by the lecture Steiner gave in 1924 drawing on his experience with Otto as well as on his own insights into the makeup of the human being and the abnormalities that can occur. The Grange is a Camp Hill community for adults with learning difficulties, part of a network of Camp Hill schools and villages throughout the world. Over the years, I've made a number of films about Camp Hill, and I've always been deeply touched by the atmosphere of warmth, tolerance and wisdom. Some of the buses are taken off. Then how are we going to get the uh, Shanks's pony or even a minibus? That's all I have to say. John, do you, do you work here every day then? Um, I work in the um, be, um, garden. I work in the garden. Do you? Yeah, I work in the pottery as well. Oh, so you've got a lot of jobs. Yeah. Which one do you like best? Pottery. Pottery. Um, yeah, you, meant pottery. To say, you meant to say the bakery. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm a bakery. Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Graham. <laughs> you work in the pottery all the time? Every day? Yeah, I work every day, every morning. Oh, yeah. What do you do in the afternoon? Then? Afternoon, I'm outside on the land on the estate. When it's raining. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to have two jobs then, is it? Yes, it is, yes. Take another one of those. It makes life easier. Workshops yeah. like this one are not seen as simply providing occupational therapy, but as an opportunity for the residents to produce goods that are valued and of use, as they themselves are valued. to do is to put this plate into the woman cupboard over, over there. I'll, sh I'll, I'll show you. I've been in camp at the age of five. So you've been in camp since you were five years old. How old are you now? Uh, I'm 23. 23, yeah. I am the youngest in my family. You're the 
youngest. Yeah, I have a big sister as well. Big sister? Yeah, yeah. two big sisters. Yeah. Do you, you go home sometimes? Yeah, I see my dad. But yeah. my parents are not together. Are they? Yeah. yeah. It's difficult, but I, got, I could get on well with my family. Yeah. Even we have ups and downs, I just get along with them. I think lots of families have ups and downs. Yeah. yeah. And you like it here? Yes. Anyway. This is like your family in a way, isn't it? Judy and Nina, my family. Yes. That's nice. Well, you're doing a wonderful job. Yes. That's the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> now I'll show you the finished plates. Can you? So that's the finished plate, yeah. Yes, it is, yes. Yeah. Must be very satisfying to do it. Uh, yes, it is. Enjoy it. Yeah, yeah I, I love it. Uh, yeah. I love w working in pottery. Yeah. Camp Hill was founded by Karl Koenig in 1939, along with a group of fellow refugees from Nazi-occupied Austria. Their angel led them to Scotland, where, inspired by the work of Rudolf Steiner, they created a worldwide movement for the care of children and adults who were, in the language of the time, in need of special care. Hang up another swallow, are you? Yes. This is my washing line. <laughs> Michael calls it my washing line. They all, they all um, made a joke out of it, but uh, I don't mind. You know a bit about Steiner? Just a little bit. He yeah. comes from Vienna, doesn't he? Uh, well, in Austria, yes. Austria? Yes. And he started a lot of camp hills. He inspired. He inspired. Yes. Inspired, that's the word I want. Yes. Yeah. And also Carl Koenig with his friend. Well, not his friend, but one of the people. Yeah. Koenig was interested in Steiner's ideas. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And he wanted to follow, follow his the impulse. That's right. Or at least yeah. try. He's trying, yes. Giving and receiving. Giving and receiving and a big rainbow and we back to ourselves to see, to see the deep blue sea. What Judy Bailey is trying to do through a therapy that Steiner developed called Eurythmy is to heal through movement, often very simple movements. How is that helping, Judy? Can you say? Oh, wait. Well, the breathing is where everything starts with the human being, isn't it? We're too excited or we're too sad. Everything is to do with breathing, breathing out, breathing in. We know that laughing is all breathing out. Crying is all breathing in. <laughs> oh, <laughs> isn't it? So we start always with the middle, with the breathing. In water. So the air coming in and the air coming out influences our well-being. So if you have too much tension, you're breathing very shallow breath and very tight, and you're making yourself ill. Or if you're too loose, your members are too loose, then you are also getting ill. So the, the breathing is very central for well-being. So we do a lot with breathing, but we don't talk about breathing because we do it through the movement. Yeah? So we might even do this exercise now, walking, which we do sometimes, don't we? So a step down, step up, step to the right, step to the left. We'll go back in a minute. Step to the right, up, down. Um, rest. Is it difficult to do, Tilly? Mm. It's a bit embarrassing. A bit embarrassing, yes. 
But you can practice. But it makes you feel better. Yeah. Yes. The more you are uh, in tune with the rhythms, less you are bound to the, the forces of the earth that are pulling you into heaviness. Without the heaviness, we wouldn't be on the earth. We would be floating, wouldn't we? Yeah. But the earth is pulling us, but we don't want to be a machine. So if we would just be Rhythm. bound to earth, yeah. yes, so to overcome that we are doing rhythms, to overcome the, that heaviness, we, yeah. we do rhythms. Yeah. Yeah. And the rhythms connect us to the rhythms of the universe. And people like Jade are very perceptive, they, they take in quite the whole thing. That's, that's why it's so wonderful, because yeah. they're not bound to the earth like some of us. That's how I see it. Anyway. Yeah. So she, she teaches you. She teaches me. Yeah. Yeah. This is the truth of the matter. <laughs> yes. And Judy teaches you. Yeah. yeah. It's a mutual yeah. fun. Yeah? yeah? Judy used the two words innocence and vulnerability as characterizing a condition that can have this healing role in the world. Being completely vulnerable, that calls out the best qualities around you and also the worst. But it has a healing influence. And anybody you will ask here that comes in here and meets people here feels they have been healed by meeting people like Jade. Later, Judy told me about the importance she attaches to working with prayer and meditation along the lines that Steiner suggested. I definitely know that there is something spiritual in me and that if I draw on it, I can be more helpful to the residents in my house. The spirituality that I'm active with, if I'm, I'm practicing meditation or I'm thinking about spiritual thoughts, the people around me feel it immediately and need it for themselves. They can't create it by themselves. Some even learn to create it, but mainly they, that's my main tool to be a house coordinator is my spiritual activity. All the rest, I mean, knowing how to cook is very good, but uh, the ability to live on a different sphere than the physicality is very important. They also know that even if they fail, they have something in them that is eternal and very complete that I recognize, and it's very important for them. And what yeah. do you understand by the word spirituality, then? The part of you that wants everything to be good and beautiful and true is what I understand that all of us have that call, that all of us actually have and desperately, desperately try to see it in others and desperately want to, others to recognize in ourselves. Yeah. Very simple, it's very down to earth, it's not up in the air. Yeah. And I know that I meet an awful lot of people who are active in that way in the world. Everyone at the Grange lives in family-sized households and the land is worked biodynamically. In charge of the gardens is Tony Carlton. You weed and ridge at the same time. All right. But only part ridge, not fully ridge. Okay. Okay? So it's just a bit because each time that you do it, it sort of accumulates. That way we we'll beat the weed much better. Tony compared Ian's vortexing of the preparation to breathing. Judy and Jade breathe, the cows breathe, the earth breathes. And so too, through stirring rhythmically, does this substance. Tony Carlton's armillary sphere is his equivalent of those planets on sticks laid out on an Indian farm. The shortest daylight hours. 
a clear, if squeaky, way to observe how the sun moves throughout the year in relation to the 12 signs of the zodiac. This sun line, as it goes through each constellation, has a different quality. So where the sun is at any particular time through the year, let's go to Easter where we've already gone from Capricorn, Aquarius, and we've come to the fishes, we've come to Pisces. If we can imagine that that accumulation of energy is happening from Christmas time to Easter, we start entering spring. Now, in the conventional farming, you will find that all the farmers will actually sow their maize or their silage and this, that and the other when the sun is in Aries. Now they don't know it's in Aries, but Aries is a warmth sign and it's an accumulation of energy that has made itself available from inside the earth, increased by the added daylight hours and Aries brings warmth, which is when the farmers sow their maize. Tony, when you say Taurus is an Earth sign, I mean, what do you actually mean by that? Mm. Well, you've got four main um, qualities. Earth, light, water, and warmth. They're the four energies that you're working from. So, um, most people who have a birthday, I don't know many people who haven't got some sort of birthday, um, that they will say, oh, I'm an earth sign, yeah? In the plant world, that earth sign also means root. So your root vegetables, yeah? With a water sign, you mean your uh, leaf vegetables. Uh, with an air sign, it's normally your flowering impulse. And then with a warmth sign, you have your fruit, yeah? So the four earth, water, fire and air are broken down to root, leaf, flower, and fruit. So I, I need to remember what a plant is. So a lettuce is very happy with Pisces, but a bean is not, because a bean would be much happier with Aries, because if I sow it in Pisces, it's just going to sit there and wait and wait. And then once it goes to Aries, you realise that actually it will start doing something. While Tony sprayed his newly stirred magic on the garden, I asked one of his apprentices what he made of all this and what he understood by our title, The Challenge of Rudolf Steiner. One thing that is very much how people do things today is that like, people don't really want to spend time with something unless they already know that it's right. Like, I think there's a, there's something in the Lord of the Rings where he describes hobbits and he says hobbits only, only have books that, that tell you about things they already know. That's very much true about, um, I think that's very much true about the way people today relate to truth. Like, they don't, like I don't know, like, I don't know, left punky people, they read like the books written by left punky people because they know there's only things in them that they anyway agree on. And I think when you try to read Rudolf Steiner, usually what I find you... Yeah, you will find that you need to open yourself to something that you do not yet know. Or like you need to make an effort without knowing... Yeah, without knowing for sure. It, it takes trust. I think that's the challenge. Rudolf Steiner's own next challenge was the editing of Goethe's scientific papers, as well as writing his key book, The Philosophy of Freedom. In 1891, at the age of 30, he was awarded a doctorate of philosophy from the University of Rostock. A year earlier, he'd moved to Weimar. It was to be a lonely seven years, working within the formality of the Goethe-Schiller archives and with no one with whom he could discuss his increasingly rich inner life of spiritual experiences. Meanwhile, his philosophical writings and insights remained largely unrecognised. I discovered Steiner when I was in my early twenties, and I was at Oxford. Uh, in a 
at the university in a highly intellectualized environment, which I hated, and studying studying f philosophy, yeah. well PPE, which includes philosophy. Philosophy was the thing that I was really interested in, keen on, and it was just agony for me. I hated it. It was Bertrand Russell and David Hume and every manner of reductionist thinker that you could imagine. And there was no real philosophy. And then I came across Steiner's work, and it was a godsend to me because there was someone talking about thinking, but in a completely different way from the abstract, intellectualized thinking that's practiced in the universities. So for me, it was like, here is a, a new direction that I can go in. And the atmosphere in the 70s, the early 70s, when I was at um, university and struggling to find my way, um, was actually very anti-intellectual amongst those people who were seeking a spiritual path. So I was caught, in a way, between um, the arid intellectualism of, of Oxford and this um, rejection of intellectualism altogether in order to, to find a spiritual way. And Steiner was very significant for me at that moment in time because he, he presented this um, alternative uh, view of, of what thinking could be. So Can you describe what that view is, then? I mean, what was well, this alternative? Well, <laughs> one of Steiner's key books is The Philosophy of Spiritual Activity, or The Philosophy of Freedom, as those two different titles. And in that book he, he describes how thinking as an activity can be intensified so that it becomes a kind of dialogue with the, the world of spirit. And that seemed to me to be a, a path that I could follow. But when you say world of spirit, I mean, you know, that can sound pretty weird to some people. Are you, are you talking about talking to spiritual beings, or what do you mean by the world of spirit? Well, yes, I do. <laughs> it may, may well sound weird, but I think that's the reality of it, yes. But of course, one, one's actually... Um, in a kind of inner dialogue with a, with a, a world of thoughts, but the, the question is, what is the source of our thinking? Where do, do, where do our thoughts come from? The, that's a, a living question, which I think anyone who's engaged with, with um, that question of what thinking really is, is, is obliged to ask. I mean, most people would probably say that our thoughts come from our brain. Most people probably would say that, yes. Well, I don't think that's actually correct. And, and even to the extent, of course, thinking is dependent on, on our having a brain. So if you cut my head off, I wouldn't be able to think. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that, that um, the source of thinking is uh, material. How long must I be silent, was the question that Rudolf Steiner was asking himself as he reached the age of 40, unable still to share his experiences of what he called die geistige Welt, the spiritual world. In 1897, he moved to Berlin, initially to edit an avant-garde literary and theatrical magazine. But it wasn't only to intellectuals and artists that he was drawn. As a result, he was asked to give courses in history at a workers' educational institute, a post he held for seven years. But among the citizens of Berlin, as elsewhere in Europe and beyond, were an increasing number of people interested in spiritual teachings, in the case of the theosophists, in a wisdom with its roots in the East. 
Here at last was an audience eager to listen to someone, not just speaking out of the past, but out of his own inner vision. By 1907, Steiner had a considerable following, but still largely members of the Theosophical Society, and many wanting a guru figure. It was a role that he tried to resist for the rest of his life. Eventually, Steiner parted ways with the Theosophists and their leader, Ani Bazant, in part prompted by their conviction that the young Indian boy, Krishnamurti, was a reincarnation of Christ, an identity that Krishnamurti himself later rejected. Steiner chose the name Anthroposophy, meaning the wisdom that lives as potential in the human being, as the name for his breakaway movement. In the following years, he travelled all over Europe, not only lecturing and writing on esoteric subjects such as karma and reincarnation and cosmic evolution, but also planting seeds, practical indications for renewal in all areas of human life, including the arts. In 1912, together with his second wife, Mare von Sievers, and in connection with the mystery plays he was writing, Steiner brought into being a new art of movement that he called Eurythmy, both as a therapy and as an art form. Sonne, du strahlentragende, deines Lichtes Stoffgewalt zaubert Leben aus der Erde unermesslich reichen Tiefen. Bravo! Dieser hat aber nicht den, den rechten Fuß gehabt. Ja. We are working with speech and we are working with music, but in such a way that we try to be music and be speech. Be music is more understandable because you have belly, they work with music, but they don't really go into the laws, if you can say that, of the music, the different elements of the music. But in tone eurythmy, you go into all the elements of music and you become them. Yeah, ganz richtig. Genau. The Steiner calls it visible song. So that what is singing, what you hear in the music, that is what we are trying to express. And with speech, the same thing. Kräfte, sie verführen dich. So the movements are, are very precise, you're not ad-libbing them? No? no, not at all. They are really born out of the elements of music. And speech. and speech too. You have the vowels, you have the consonants. Yeah. What we usually use when we speak, and we don't think about it, that it's possible also to express through movements this speech. Herz, du Seelentragendes, deines Lichtes Geistgewalt, Nur hier haben wir das Gleiche wie vorher, Seelentragende, nicht Tragende. Margareta Zolstad leads the Eurythmy Ensemble based at the Goetheanum in Switzerland, the center of the now worldwide Anthroposophical Society. Eurythmy may not, on its own, save the world, and the shape of the Goetheanum may not be to everyone's taste. They are, however, 
attempt by Steiner to waken people's awareness to what is seemingly hidden behind the world of appearances. Eurythmy explores this other dimension in both music and speech. And for Steiner, it was not a case of spirit or matter, heaven or earth, but rather spirit and matter. There is only one world, but it is infinitely more complex and many-layered than a purely materialistic mindset is willing to acknowledge. Over many years, through a combination of diligent meditation and an open heart, Steiner developed the natural clairvoyance he was born with into a faculty that made possible what he called spiritual science, a way of seeing, open to us all, that goes beyond our sense impressions and a narrowly focused intellect. To help awaken the spiritual in the human being to the spiritual in the universe is how he once described his task. In other words, the human being is, potentially, as the ancients taught, a microcosm of the macrocosm. Steiner was no longer silent, no longer alone, but he paid the price. He had stuck his head above the parapet and was shot at from many directions. In the ten or so years to come, until his premature death in 1925 at the age of 64, there were indeed triumphs, but also tragedies. Yet despite exhaustion and illness, Steiner continued in his efforts to remind us of our evolutionary potential and that we are not alone in the universe. Indeed, that we are made in the image and likeness of God. Some listened, some not. Herein lay the challenge, both for him and now for us. A prison in South Wales, not the sort of place you would immediately associate with the teachings of an Austrian philosopher and visionary who died in 1925. But Rudolf Steiner was used to challenges, and he challenged us. Phil Forder runs educational courses at Park Prison. Over 20 years ago, with a young son to educate, he came across a Rudolf Steiner Waldorf school and eventually taught there himself, first in the kindergarten and then for eight years as a class teacher in the middle school. He has worked in the prison for 11 years. I often say to myself, and I just hear it all the time there, by the grace of God, and I think that's, that's very appropriate in, in a prison. Um, and you do come into life with strengths and weaknesses, and I think it's a, a, the job of a teacher, and a, that extends into here, is to um, help people to, uh, to fulfill their potential, their destiny. Phil was initially engaged at the prison as an art teacher, helping the men to learn to draw and paint. What I'm doing now is, is not so much teaching art, but using art as the medium to deliver self-development and to look at yourself. I feel things happen to you in your life which you might say, well, they're out of your control, but they are in your control because if you believe in karma, then they obviously are. So. There's meaning in all of it. Yeah. 
Do you find that the prisoners can come to an understanding of that? Yes, I do. I do. I think they can. Um, sometimes in a very uh, conscious way and sometimes not so conscious, but I do think that you're dealing with the whole person, not just what you see in front of you. Yeah. I mean, is that what you try and do with your work with them, then? Is that what you're trying to do? Uh, I think it's a, a waking up. It's a, it's a connection. It's a trying to put into place something that's missing. And usually the momentum for, for that comes from the, the, the man themselves, not from me. I just present the opportunity or the, try and present the possibility for that to happen. But it's actually them who take it up with, 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 with a lot of gusto, actually, because it's, it's, it's what they want. So how is that similar to what you did as a, as a boarding school teacher, then? Because I think you're working with the same forces. You're working with not just the cognitive forces, you're working with the feeling life and with the behaviour, the will. Um, so you're, you're actually working with people in a more holistic way. Yeah. And recognising the, the, the bigger picture. I think what Steiner was trying to bring was the was several things, but I, for me, the main thing was that there's a lot more to our existence and what we perceive than meets the eye. What does meet the eye is that some people seem to be dealt rotten cards in life. Whether these situations are, in Phil's words, karmic or simply come about through chance, is difficult to really know. But Steiner's statement, we are slaves of the past but masters of the future, is, I find, a helpful challenge, whatever the reasons and the circumstances in which we find ourselves. What happened yesterday clearly influences today, but tomorrow is up to us. Ruskin Mill in Gloucestershire is a Steiner-inspired residential college for young people between the ages of 16 and 25 who had, until now, for one reason or another, fallen through the educational net. They have, in the current jargon, learning difficulties. The students work on the land and in craft workshops, not necessarily to become farmers or craftsmen, but rather to experience what pupils in Steiner Waldorf schools in particular learn at an earlier age, to exercise their physical skills and coordination and to actually make something as a sound basis for the more abstract and intellectual learning that follows. At Ruskin Mill, they are therefore aiming to recreate some of the earlier developmental stages that many of the students have missed, and in a situation where the role model of the adult is crucial. We don't throw it too close to there because they might, smaller fish might swim down there. That's we right. don't throw it too close to the side because otherwise it gets caught in all the rocks and then it causes sort of disease and bacteria. Ross, if there's any problems, you can just hold the horses, can't you? Yeah. Hold fast. Hold. Above all, they're trying to help young people, whatever their past difficulties, to move on, to take the reins and to become masters of their future. We're educating more than just the, the, the intellect of the, of the student because that hasn't worked for them very often in the past. So we're really educating the, the head, the hands, the heart and, and seeing them as a whole being and understanding that if you educate the hand, then actually you're educating them the head as well through your feeling realm so it's um, it's a very holistic picture of how to educate somebody and that happens on the farm and in the craft workshop and in the kitchen and in the household wherever the students are encountering life at Ruskin Mill. The work of the Ruskin Mill Educational Trust is the inspiration of Angus Gordon. The source of his inspiration, besides Rudolf Steiner, is the 19th century craftsman and designer William Morris and the art critic and philosopher John Ruskin. Over the past 18 years, the organisation has grown from 35 students to 300 students and with six further centres across Britain. 
transforming material, wood, clay and metal, and growing their own food as an inspiration for transforming themselves is the essence of this educational initiative. One of the challenges that Ruder Steiner actually places in the world is that problems have to be gone through. They have to be overcome. They can't be avoided for true transformation. And any offer of education or intervention that doesn't value at the heart the freedom of the individual to continue recycling their own pain, if you like, or their own trauma. If they don't want to take that step, it is absolutely clear you can only offer them simple tools to start that journey. Don't come back up the hill, just come down it, okay? okay. Yeah, and then that this hump. <laughs> What's happened? I didn't see that. You just the, cut the string? The string went too close. Right. <laughs> the string went too close. <laughs> Emerson College in Sussex is an adult educational centre where Steiner's work is studied and developed. I did a course there myself over 40 years ago. And this very hard and lonely decision quite often to end. And what I wanted to say, it's helpful, I think, to know that externally ending a relationship does not end it, that it will find its resolution in time. This Relationships are the topic currently being explored for a diploma course in biographical counselling, underpinned by the notion that we're not just determined by the interplay of nature and nurture, but that each one of us has a spiritual biography what Carl Jung called a person's story, and that the circumstances of our past lives play into each new incarnation, what is often described as our karma. Are you saying that, that our relationships, whether they be the, the good ones or the difficult ones, invariably have some sort of karmic uh, element to them? Yeah, almost always you could say that we have, we have, we share a past, we have met before, and the question is what are we doing now? So almost invariably we have a history with each other. And really Steiner is very strong about that. It's really time to wake up to that, to let the other wake us up to become aware of them and through them becoming aware of ourselves. He talks about that we are each other's initiators. Yeah, into the mystery of what is a human being. So to be able to carry that person in our thoughts with their particular struggle, even if we cannot live together. When we listen to somebody's story, we can sometimes hear this, and sometimes people say, I, I was born this way, I was born with this question. So we, I think already people have intuitions that this has come from somewhere else. So we don't remember, but we have a growing sense of, like, oh, hello again, I, I know you, or, oh my God, it's you again, you know, that kind of feeling. I think this, people do have that experience. And redeem the pictures of each other, because it's very painful to, for both partners to be carrying a negative picture of the other. But you're not trying to help people understand or remember their past lives, no, no. no, it's not about that. Because anyway, I mean, no, it's actually more, much more to the future. So can I understand what I've done in this life? Can I get in touch, get a handle on my own biography so I can take a step into the future? So it's much more future orientated. What, yeah, what's calling me? How can I realize what I've come to do, but not about what I have done or what I have been in my past life. Steiner's own biography, 
His biography as Rudolf Steiner, born 1861, died 1925, philosopher, educationalist, visionary, is dominated by the question he was increasingly asking himself as he reached the age of 40. How long must I be silent? Already as a boy growing up in the Austrian countryside, the son of a humble railway official, he had spiritual experiences about which he could speak to no one. His years as a student in Vienna towards the end of the 19th century were increasingly dominated by his encounter with the work of Goethe, Goethe the scientist. Here he began to find a bridge between his own study of the sciences and philosophy and his inner world of supersensible experiences. It pointed to a new and deeper way of knowing. Steiner then spent seven years in Weimar, editing Goethe's scientific papers and writing his key book, The Philosophy of Freedom. In 1897, he arrived in Berlin, aged 36, still unable to speak out about his realization, both through study and meditation, that what we call spirit is not somewhere else, but rather is interwoven with the material world around us and indeed within our own being. There is only one world. Spirit and matter are not separate. It was among the theosophists in the early years of the 20th century that Steiner finally found an audience interested and open to his insights and experiences. But what was becoming the most powerful experience of all finally brought about the break with many of these early followers. For the theosophists, Jesus Christ was just one of many great teachers throughout history. For Steiner, Christ's incarnation as a deed of huge cosmic significance became a powerful and transformative experience. It's not a sectarian understanding of Christ, so I think he's, he's not wanting to associate Christ too closely with the Christian church. I mean, I think the Christian church, sadly, is all too sectarian sometimes. Um, for Steiner, it's, um, it's a strong view of how humanity as a whole is transformed by Christ. Fraser Watts is a priest in the Church of England and someone with a long interest in the work of Rudolf Steiner. He's also a fellow of Queen's College, Cambridge, and reader in theology and science. There's been quite a big tendency in the 20th century to, um, to do a retreat to some kind of subjective or existential understanding of Christianity. But Steiner is absolutely going in the opposite direction. For him, it is just an objective fact that the um, evolution of human consciousness was changed by Christ. I mean, take it or leave it. I mean, and, and even if no one had known about that, even if there had never been anyone of Christian faith, for Steiner, I think that transformation of human consciousness would still have happened as a result of the work of Christ. The church at Potschak, in the village where Steiner lived until he was eight years old. As a child and throughout his life, he was drawn to a great variety of people, priests included. In his autobiography, he describes his father as a free thinker. For Steiner himself, what increasingly mattered was knowledge. But the kind of knowledge in which science and religion, faith and reason are not at odds. A scientist of the invisible is how he has sometimes been described. I think the distinctive thing about Steiner's approach to that is to want to find some scientific approach to religious and spiritual questions. There are different ways of bringing science and religion into dialogue, but I think that's what's distinctive, to approach... Um, um, I think he would say the spiritual rather than the religious, but to approach the spiritual in a scientific way. He clearly has exceptional powers. Because they're so unusual, it's hard to know quite how to characterise those, but he's clearly some kind of clairvoyant. And he's unusually disciplined and highly trained in the way he uses those clairvoyant powers. 
and he has such a serious sense of purpose um, to um, leave the world a better place as a result of his mission. And arising out of that, all this great outpouring of practical activity. And I don't know of anyone else who, who um, spans all those things, really, has the exceptional powers, is so disciplined with them, so purposeful and so practical. I think that's a unique contribution. Why is Steiner not better known, do you think? It's an interesting question why Steiner isn't better known. I think there are various reasons. Um, there's something off-putting about his writings. I think that that has to be said. What the style, you mean? Yes, yes, yes. Style and content, I think. And, and also something off-putting about the society, the kind of following that he has sometimes built up around him, which can look rather too cult-like from the outside. Not at all what he wanted, I think, but it can look like that. The network of people interested in Steiner's ideas is worldwide and growing. Here, in Hyderabad, in South India, several hundred are gathering for a conference of the Asia-Pacific region of the Anthroposophical Society, Anthroposophy being the name Steiner chose for his movement after his break with the Theosophists. Most, if not all, of these people would reject the notion of a cult, in that as teachers, farmers, doctors and therapists, although interested and inspired by Steiner's insights, they are working hard to make these insights their own and to take them further, as well as to learn from important developments in education, science, medicine and psychology since Steiner's death nearly a hundred years ago. I'm originally from the UK. I met Anthroposophy 33, 34 years ago in a school for handicapped children uh, near Reading. It's now a ward of school. At that time it was a, a special school. Some severely um, disadvantaged children there. And I worked as the gardener. And my wife worked as the cook. And for me, meeting the work of Rudolf Steiner was like um, finding water in the desert. Most of my teaching in Waldorf education has been in Australia. And in the last few years of still teaching in Australia, in the 90s, I already started to come to Asia during my holidays and made contact with various very grassroots initiatives beginning the Waldorf schools. And little by little this grew, and now I work full time, really. Um, and particularly now in China and Taiwan. What is the response then to Steiner in that part of the world? It's exploding. It's phenomenal what is happening in China at the moment. It's, I would say the people or the people who come to the, the, the training courses and seminars and the initiatives that have started in China, those people, I would say, are hungry. They're really hungry to find meaning in their lives. They're, they're hungry to connect with the outside world. And they're deeply grateful. That is my experience, and this is what gives me energy. The mainstream education in China is very, very tough, very, very competitive, and uh, you know, the, the children, they, they are forced to study from very young, from kindergarten back to two, three years old. And uh, more and more parents realize this is not what they want. And actually, you know, like the world of schools and kindergartens, most in initiatives are parents. Ancient China was also very much part of my, my pathway towards Anthroposophy. And I think what they find in the work of Rudolf Steiner is the holistic context within which everything has meaning and everything has an importance. And so it was in their, own, in their own culture. To be an artist was at the same time to, an expression of being a human being. To whatever it was that one was doing, one was part of something greater than oneself. And the ethic was to really put yourself fully into what you were doing. Yeah. So I think they recognize something of, of a culture that, that has been broken in China. 
through many events. Um, there are some people who want to bring back that culture into Waldorf education. It's like make, make it an entirely Chinese um, education. But there are others who take, a, in my view, a more, a more balanced point of view and recognize the ancient world has gone. Yeah. We live in the modern world. But we can, we can go forward in this modern world and, f and re-find the ancient world in a modern context. And I, that's, for me, what anthroposophy does. And it's fascinating for me that all the different cultures I've been to, and I've had the privilege of traveling cheaply, I have to say, but traveling to many, many parts of the world. And again and again, I found that people there can say, like here in India, they can say, but anthroposophy is just a repetition of what we already know. Yeah? And so many people have the, the, the wrong understanding that Steiner just gathered this and this and this and put it all together. But the reason that they can find their own culture in anthroposophy is because within anthroposophy there is something intrinsically human. It is universal. And this universality expressed itself in the past in all the different healthy cultures. And in today, today I feel that what we what we are in the process of doing all around the world, not just people involved with anthroposophy, but we are creating a new culture. I am a Zoroastrian, and uh, in Zoroastrianism, there is nothing like karma. It's a re re resurrection uh, theory there. So for me, karma, there wasn't resistance. In fact, I found my answers to some things that happened in my life. Karma was one of the sort of tool for me to understand why things happen. And uh, Steiner's view made me look at, look at my own religion in a different way. It's not that I'm rejecting uh, Zoroastrianism completely. But I understand my religion much better now because of Steiner's viewpoints. A key message running through many of Steiner's lectures and books on humanity's spiritual journey is that evolution has essentially been an evolution of consciousness, and therefore that our relationship to nature, to each other, and indeed to the divine, to God, has gradually changed. The more we have become individualized, the more we have forgotten our sense of interconnectedness with the world around us and with the universe itself. This feeling of separation, I'm me and you're you, has given us our sense of self, yet has come at a certain cost. But the journey isn't over. In the words of T.S. Eliot, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. While in Hyderabad, I visited one of India's seven Steiner Waldorf schools, four of which are in Hyderabad. Sloka was founded in 1997 and has nearly 400 pupils. Like all Waldorf schools, crafts, music and art are an important ingredient. But it is the morning two-hour main lessons that are at the heart of the Waldorf curriculum. So we would do a little bit of recall of what we have done last year in physics. And from what they are taught in history, science, geography, etc., the pupils create their own textbooks. This book is very beautiful. This is excellent. This is about astronomy that is done in class six. We begin with the sunset and we continue the observation till sunrise. This is the earth and the position of man. In class six, when we are doing the astronomy block, we ask the children to stay back in school for a night and throughout the night, they observe the sky. From the North Star, we start our story. 
All the constellations are observed by the children throughout the night. And this is how it goes on till sunrise. So the next day, the child has to write about his, what he observed the previous night. Three or four weeks are devoted to each main lesson subject, and the pupils will learn about that subject initially from their teacher and not from textbooks. They will then write up and illustrate the lesson themselves. And everything taught is aimed to correspond to where the children themselves are at in their own development. Class 8 is a very difficult class where they just want to break all the rules and just be independent and be themselves. They do not want any teacher. They just need a very, very strong authority to control them. Yeah. Here we do the revolutions in history. So that is the time when a revolution is happening within them also. None of these pupils will have started formal learning including reading and writing, until they enter class one, around the age of six or seven. In India, as elsewhere in the world, what increasingly concerns many parents in particular is the stress their children experience, both in terms of the pressures of living in the modern world, but also the pressure of having to achieve, to score points, tick boxes, pass exams, all with the aim of eventually getting a good job but, in the opinion of many people, coming far too early in their lives. At Sloka's kindergarten in Hyderabad, the emphasis is on a very simple and rhythmic routine of creative play and stories or simply having time to watch and wonder. As little children, they cannot differentiate between play and work. For adults, we know that there's a play time and a work time, but children, play is as important because it's all imitation, that they imitate whatever they see. And actually, if they're like I'm cutting fruit, they could be, you know, cutting an imaginary fruit there, but they're actually doing it. It's, it could look as play for us, but for them it's real work, they're actually cutting fruit. Or perhaps they're actually cooking something. It is work for them. They cannot differentiate between work and play. What Steiner emphasized when he founded the first Waldorf school in 1919 in Stuttgart was that childhood has distinct phases and the children not only have to grow up and learn the ways of the world, but also need time and space so that what each one brings into the world can unfold harmoniously. Trailing clouds of glory is how Wordsworth expressed it. Though some of the baggage we carry on our backs, maybe from past lives, is often far from glorious. simple and unhurried. It is this atmosphere that is attracting more and more parents to Waldorf kindergartens all over the world. Here in upstate New York, in the Hawthorne Valley Waldorf School, I came across this growing awareness that if childhood is eroded, we are diminished as adults. There's a story, uh, I think it's from Zorba the Greek, about him uh, holding a butterfly that's just come out of a cocoon and wanting to uh, see it fly. So he tries to blow on the wings to dry the wings before their time, before they're really strengthened and ready. And the butterfly ends up crumbling and unable to really fly. And, and, and its time was not yet come for it. So we're giving children time. I asked Janine whether she believed there'd been some golden age when all was peace and harmony. No, I, I think every age has had its struggles, but I, I feel that, uh, you know, it's all a, for, a remembering and a forgetting, and we've done quite a bit of forgetting, and it's time to do some remembering again. <laughs> That's really what I feel. And 
Steiner brought so much, but also many other humanitarians, Gandhi and, and Tolstoy and, and many great thinkers have brought these gifts. So wherever we go, uh, if we can find ourselves centered again and being able to remember our true purpose of, of why we're here in serving each other and in regenerating this gift of life. The teachers who come forward to work in places like the Hawthorne Valley School, one of over a hundred Waldorf schools in the USA, share what many other people feel these days, a view that education is not just about imparting knowledge, but is also about awakening and nurturing what the children already know. Tell me about your... Uh... Torin Finzer is chair of the education department at nearby Antioch University in New England and general secretary of the Anthroposophical Society in America. Which grade is she in now? The great crime of our time is that in too many educational settings, the adult consciousness, the intellectual adult consciousness is pressed on the young child in the name of performance, in the name of academic achievement. And that is a great crime to childhood because what's happening there is you're denying the innate qualities that live in the child at that time. As well as the Waldorf School in Hawthorne Valley, there's a 400-acre biodynamic farm an active youth group called Think Outward, a bakery and shop, and a kitchen garden from which vegetables are trucked twice a week to Union Square Green Market in New York City. Coordinating this whole Hawthorne Valley operation, an attempt to tackle our day-to-day -day needs in a healthier and saner way, is Martin Ping. There's a lot that doesn't seem to make too much sense anymore, and, and, uh, and yet we've grown up with it. This is, we've created it. Human beings have created the system we're in now, so, so there's something in that that we are challenged by, because it's not like it was necessarily just imposed from outer space or something. We did this. So how do we find our way out of it if, it's, if, we're, if we're beginning to see the cracks and we're beginning to feel like it's not meeting us at a very, very deep human level, then how do we... How do we find our way back out? I think Steiner really had a lot of very fine indications that provide a bit of a roadmap for that. And, and it's not just Steiner. I mean, there's obviously many, many uh, ways in which people are approaching our modern predicament. Agriculture is certainly one of our modern predicaments. And already back in 1924, when Steiner gave a course of lectures to farmers in Central Europe, there was concern about the effect that chemical fertilizers were having on the soil and on the quality of the food we eat. The importance of organic farming is increasingly recognized. Steiner's biodynamic method goes further in that the preparations used on the land are designed not only to enhance the quality of the produce, but also to heal the earth in the process and a recognition of the role that not only the sun and moon, but also the planets play in plant growth and health determines when you plant what. I asked the farmer in charge at Hawthorne Valley for his reaction to our title, The Challenge of Rudolf Steiner. I think his basic challenge, I would think he was so far, I mean, I think the picture of agriculture that he gives is going to be valid for hundreds and hundreds of years still for us to really grasp it. And, and then certainly the, the real challenge for all of us is um, <laughs> develop the insight and develop the, the, the capacities to really see what he described. You know, it's not good enough to just be able to recount it. We'll have to be able to see it. <coughs> to develop insights and capacities of their own, is what these two modern-day alchemists are trying to do in this Californian garage. Their task, to make biodynamic preparations based on indications by Steiner that are not only an effective alternative to chemical and potentially harmful substances that are marketed worldwide, but are also more appropriate to the soil and climate of California and the tropics than those used in Western Europe. 
I asked Dennis Klocek to what extent Steiner was tapping into something that we knew in the past and have forgotten. Rudolf Steiner didn't appear just out of the blue. Uh, there's, there's an old saying, genius never escapes its age. So he was a genius. And he brought the best elements from the ancient traditions together and synthesized them in, in a scientific context. That's why his work is called Spiritual Science. He thought it was really important that the scientific context be recognized by spiritually minded people. Because he grew up at a time <clears throat> in his development when spiritism and Ouija boards and table tapping and seances, that was the way people got access to spirit. And he inherited the mantle of theosophy, and that was part of their lore. And what he said was, no, it has to be made in the same way that we make science. However, on the other side of science is this death rationale force that can't imagine life forces and beings as spiritual beings. That's a whole other dimension, and they're separated now. And so it's necessary to bring those two together for, in order for science to be redeemed and in, in order for spiritual wor work to, be, to move into the future rather than just be stuck on what we inherited from the past. It has to move into the future, but the scientific revolution is not uh, random. It's not an anomaly. It's a reality. So it's not going to go away. So the scientific worldview is not going to go away. So we can't just go out and hug trees and talk about fairies and hope that that's going to go somewhere. Even if that's the perception that we have, uh, that has to be grounded in, um, in reason. So it's both. It's an inheritance from the past. And if you read Paracelsus and Basil Valentine and the alchemists, you'll see everywhere in their work is this threads that Rudolf Steiner was picking on and pulling forward. And yet, with his cosmology and his rational training in science, he could move it further. Dennis Klocek teaches consciousness studies at this college near Sacramento. His colleague, Matthias Baker, a fellow researcher, is consultant to a number of biodynamic vineyards in California. When Dennis referred earlier to his preparations as medicine for the earth, I asked him why the earth needed medicine. If we left it alone and stopped spraying it with chemicals, wouldn't it be perfectly happy? No. If we left it alone, it would be very lonely because it's our mother, and she says to us all the time, you haven't called home in a while. You're only using my bank account to live. So you need to love me and nurture me and uh, feed me with medicines because I'm sick from your neglect. They say in esoteric circles, if you don't have the organ of perception, if you don't actually work on yourself to perceive in the proper way, you just see the world as it is, not as it could be. Rudolf Steiner could see the world as it could be, not as it was or as it is even now. We saw the world as it could be, and that's a lonely path. It's a very lonely path. For me, what, what is unique about the work of Rudolf Steiner, what's inspired my life about it, is that it's not just a tradition. He threw down the glove and said, you have to do something with this. 
The Benziger family have been doing something with this land for over 30 years. Biodynamic wine is becoming highly prized, not just here in California, but across the world. And like all biodynamic farms, this enterprise avoids the modern trend for monocrops. Alongside the vines, there are animals and a great variety of plants and herbs that help regulate the insect population and balance the farm as a totality, avoiding the need for chemicals and artificial fertilizers. They call it the insectary. Basically, it, it propagates with bugs, then they sort it out. We, we, we have some good bugs and some bad bugs, then they slug it out here. Um, and hopefully what we do is we have a balance so that they're in here eating the plants and eating each other instead of going out there and eating the grapevines. Because if we were monocropping, then we put a huge bullseye in the back of that grapevine because the only thing that's green is that grapevine, so every bug is going to fly and eat that. Here, we have a wide expanse, so there's a lot of things on the menu, not just the grapevines. <laughs> and the entire 85 acres are treated with the organic preparations that all biodynamic farmers use. So we're talking about... Chris Benziger and his family have farmed here in the Sonoma district since the 1980s. When we first moved out here, we were very much conventional farmers because we didn't know any better. In conventional farming, I kind of call it the spray and pray method. Yeah. For every disease or every bug, you had a spray out there. And for every lack of nutrients in the vineyard, you had a, um, a fertilizer that you put down, chemical one. So we did that. And since this place was left vacant for 50 years, it was in wonderful state. It was a beautiful piece of property. But we slowly killed it with spraying these pesticides. And I remember being a small kid running through here, and it was a verdant garden. And then every year, it would die a little bit until eventually, in the mid-'80s, it was a green desert. The only thing that was green were the canopies of the grapevines nothing else. And the only sound I heard weren't insects, but the wind. It was pretty much a dead place, and the ground was crunchy. It was hard, if not pulverized. And so we had um, erosion issues, and then worst of all, the quality of the wine was diminishing. We were really putting scars on this land that we couldn't heal. We realized very quickly we had to do something. And so in, in the early 90s, um, we, uh, my brother had a book on biodynamics that he had toted around uh, his whole life, and he the book kind of jumped out at him. At the same time, he met this wonderful guy by the name of Alan York, who was uh, kind of the biodynamic guru out there. And the two uh, got together and formed a great friendship. And we started to, in 1994, started to bring in biodynamic practices here. And it took us about six years. But in the year 2000, we were certified, the first winery in the Sonoma Napa area to be certified by Demeter as a biodynamic winery. And this place changed radically, going from this green desert to this beautiful piece of property that you see here today. Mm. It's gorgeous. It's alive on many levels. And, and people like Matthias then have been advising you, yeah? Oh, Matthias and, and Alan have been instrumental in us on how to understand this piece of property and unlock the secrets um, of farming biodynamically. Chris and Matthias went on to tell me that essentially the vine doesn't want to be alone. I asked them if that was true of plants altogether is monoculture against nature. I, I personally think it absolutely is. Yeah, and we see that because nature always fills the gaps in terms of exactly. where the balance needs. So you'll see disease pressure, funguses, or um, uh, different insects that come in to kind of help break down that monoculture in a sense. And there's evidence there that shows that nature recognizes it as an imbalance. Chris, you've got this wonderful visitor centre. People come here and, and look around. And what's the public's reaction to biodynamics? They, um, they're in, uh, first is wow. I didn't realize all that went on to make a bottle of wine. That's the first thing that they kind of say. And then they go. A lot of them say, "Well, that's how my grandfather farmed," or "That's how my, you know, my my old uncle back in the old land farmed." So there's this natural um, kind of. Um, understanding of it of how it should be and then there's this kind of wow i wish we could do that you could see everybody wants to get a little dirt under their fingernails when they come here and they understand that it's it's a very complicated system on one hand but also an extremely simple system on the other because it's following mother nature the idea is we are so inbred to hang on to the steering wheel and drive mother nature it's really hard to take your hands off the steering wheel and let mother nature drive 
But there's a lot more to what you're doing than what's called organic uh, agriculture, isn't there? I mean, it brings in this whole element of the planets. I mean, what do people think about that? Well, that therein is, is, there is a little element there where people think, whoa, that's, that's crazy. But it's funny because when you explain to them rhythms and things like that, then they get it. But when you just say cow horn and biodynamics, they think, what the heck's a cow horn for? But biodynamics is more than just cow horns filled with cow manure that are buried in the earth for six months over the winter before spraying the substance that's created onto the land. What underlies Steiner's picture of nature, and indeed the whole phenomenal world, including ourselves, is an invisible realm of beings, some more evolved than we are, some less so, that support and sustain life in its fullest sense. I asked Chris how his fellow Americans related to the idea that what they call God is intimately connected to what surrounds us in our daily lives and not only to a heaven that is somewhere else. That there is, in other words, only one world. In the States, we have no problem with religion, okay? You know, with this God-fearing and, and the Holy Spirit. But those same people that go to church on Sunday <laughs> have the hardest time understanding natural spirits, the, the rhythms of nature that you know, their God supposedly brings here, they don't see that part of it, these natural systems. So it's very hard for people to, um, they're, they understand religion, but they're not spiritual in the sense that they don't follow what's happening naturally right underneath their noses. Instead, they want to have a chemical package tell them that this is better than actually following a natural rhythm, which I don't understand um, because the beauty is right here. This, is, this piece of property is, is, is the best church in the world. Uh, when you see it in action. You have to believe that there's some higher order when you walk around and see what's happening here. You don't need to walk into a temple or a, a church or a mosque to see that. I think nature is very wise, but it is not free. We are not very wise, but we are free. So giving our, our, ourselves in the freedom that we carry to nature in a certain way, that's the preparations, as grinding up a silica crystal to to bring it in a gravity condition to a levity condition so it becomes active again to the rhythms, that is our work. But it's the wisdom that is in nature that teaches us how to do that. So I'm not saying that we're wiser than nature. We're, no, the, the, the creative, we, if I was to try to uh, build a plant, it would not happen. It wouldn't work out too well. <laughs> it wouldn't work out too well. So that's what I'm saying is that's, that's there's a there's a language there's a script in there that is is amazing matthias went on to suggest that our challenge is to reconnect to nature and to the earth in a way that is sacred but sacred in a new way and that for him the essence of steiner's message to farmers is that the work they do on the land needs to be accompanied by the work they do on themselves, a message that could apply to all of us, whatever we do. This young man is at work 3,000 miles from the Benziger Winery in California, but still in the USA. Tucked away in New England is Copaic, a Camp Hill village community for adults with learning difficulties. Gardens, a farm, workshops, a shop and bakery. 230 people live and work here, one of over a hundred such communities worldwide. The founders of Camp Hill, refugees from Nazi-occupied Austria, began their work in Scotland in 1939 inspired by the course of lectures on curative education that Steiner gave in 1924. Camp Hill's approach is, and always has been, that behind the mask, behind the damaged and sometimes thwarted lives in which some people find themselves, lives an individuality as whole as every other person, but, like all of us, on their own particular journey. They contribute to the community to the best of their ability, 
and it is often their vulnerability and openness that helps heal the turmoil that surrounds many so-called normal people. Vulnerability, but often great skills and patience. In this case, important work in Copake's seed marketing enterprise. Seeds that are open pollinated and therefore able to produce plants from which further seeds can be produced. In contrast to the hybrid variety marketed by the large seed companies which produce outwardly impressive plants, but plants incapable of reproducing themselves. Penny Baring teaches on a course for young people training to work at Copeg. Originally she studied journalism, but her social conscience, so she told me, and her wish to do work unconnected to a system of wages drew her to Camp Hill. I asked her what she thought Steiner's unique contribution had been to this sort of work. I think one of the greatest things he's put into the mix as far as how we understand or, or, or relate to a person with disabilities is the fact that this is not the only life they will have and that it's possible to do things now which will give them the possibility to have a future incarnation which is whole and healthy. So that's the one thing. But I think the another thing is that through our efforts to understand what people call abnormality, we come much, much, much closer to understanding what humanity itself is. Often on my first day of class, I stand in front of the blackboard and I have a piece of chalk and I ask people to say, what's a human being? And they go through all the lists of this speaking and walking and thinking and standing and, and on and on and on. And then I start, I say, very well, and then I start erasing. Okay, are they still a human being? They're still a human being and taking, gradually taking things away. And of course, people are left a bit stunned to realize that even without many, many qualities, a human being is a human being. What is a human being? perhaps the most important question that Steiner addressed. But have his insights from the very beginning remained imprisoned almost by some of the people who call themselves anthroposophists? I asked the baker, Joseph Papas, whether he thought that Camp Hill communities like Copeg have tended to isolate themselves from the world at large, and whether Steiner's legacy altogether has become too exclusive. I guess it, it, it can be, though I don't know that it's specific to his, to his legacy as such. I think that that isolation tends to happen with any sort of content that comes into the world. Um, and I certainly would never say it was his intention. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I can say it seems in the, in the biography of this community that there was a time in, in the growth of the community that it seemed really important that it more or less separated off a little bit in order to grow and to become strong and then Maybe that that's also can be reflected in the individual as an inner process as one comes to terms with oneself. But I certainly feel like in this community, but also in this region, there's a lot of feeling that we're now at the point where we need to grow a bit beyond our borders. Where we walk to school each day, Indian children used to play all about our native land, where the shops and houses stand, and the trees were very tall, and there were no streets at all, not a church 
not a steeple, only woods and Indian people, only wigwams on the ground, and at night they're prowling round. What a different place today, where we live and work and play. Please have a seat. Jack Petrush has been a Waldorf teacher for 30 years. And this is the fourth time he's taken a class through the eight years until the children reach the age of 15. Silent arithmetic. Here we go. Reverse the digits. <laughs> Neil. Nearly two hours later, and the morning main lesson is over. One of Jack's concerns is that in the Waldorf School movement, there isn't always sufficient interest and appreciation for some of the positive things being pioneered in mainstream education. On the other hand, mainstream appreciation of Waldorf methods is also not much in evidence. I asked him if any sort of dialogue is taking place. I wish I could say that it was happening in um, a marked way, but it happens more in small ways. There are educators who are coming out of mainstream who can appreciate what Waldorf has to offer. Good, listen carefully. But unfortunately, they're few and far Good. between. And in our climate in America, with no child left Good. behind, and the tremendous pressure on testing that came out of the Bush era and has continued, unfortunately, with President Obama, it's very hard for the ideas of, that are essential to Waldorf to resonate within the educational community. There's just too much pressure. The man who trained me to be a teacher, John Gardner, he taught us that discipline begins with self-discipline and that it's our ability to take ourselves in hand that really will help us to guide children in the right way, to be worthy of all they give you, because children look up to you in the most remarkable way. They see us as better than we are. You know, they, they when they're young, um, they, they see us um, as individuals who hold knowledge I want you to just to trim it off a little bit right and off. wisdom and like the ability to solve their problems. If you have lots of sap, and you it's not that we ever can live up to that completely, but if, we, if I work on myself, then I feel at least I'm more worthy of the love and affection they give you. I think about the world that the children that we teach and raise will inherit and how many problems will be in that world. And I think about the kind of thinking that's going to be needed to solve the complex, seemingly insolvable problems that we have in the world with the environment, with our cities, with our prisons, and even in America with our democracy. And I know that the problems aren't going to be solved easily. They're going to require a type of thinking that is new and innovative. And I believe Waldorf kids, and I'm not just saying this to, to sell Waldorf, but I believe the kind of thinking that's fostered in a Waldorf school allows children to think out of the box. I feel children are going to need to ask the questions that nobody's asking yet to help solve the world's problems. 
I gave the last word to three of the older pupils at the Waldorf School in Washington, D.C. I love the class size. I mean, you find that in every Waldorf school, the small classes. And I was in public school for three years, and that was very different. Um, you had different classmates every year and different teachers every year. And I like having the same ones to kind of develop relationships with. Yeah. That's been fantastic. That's one of my favorite parts of the school. And I also love main lesson and how you get to make your own textbooks. You don't have to like, use them. I like praise that wherever I go and people ask me. That's what comes to mind is the main lesson books for me. Going back to the teachers, I feel really nurtured and supported with how much you get to know your teachers in such a deep level. And you feel like friends, but it's still a professional relationship. Yeah. yeah. So it's that's great. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely just the student teacher relationship that is really important. And it makes you want to learn more. And it makes you dedicated to your work. And it means a lot more than, than just work because they're not just teachers. Later, I talked to a group of 18-year-olds at Michael Hall in Sussex, the first Waldorf school to be founded in Britain back in 1925. I asked them what they'd most appreciated about their education. I think what I like most about science education is that it prepares you for life, not yeah. for just exams. Yeah. And I think when you leave school, you're prepared for all aspects of life. Yeah. Not yeah. just prepared yeah, for an exam. Yeah. yeah. It's not just crafts and arts, um, and it's not just academic, it's finding a balance about everything. And that's where, that's how we go out into the world, is potentially we, have, we go out as balanced human beings to grow and to mature and so on in later life, but it, that's, that's what makes it so rich. These books, they're called what, your main lesson books, aren't they? I know they're not necessarily your own, but did you, did you find that helpful to do things that way? I mean, you didn't have textbooks, you created your own textbooks, is that the idea? Yeah. Yes. It really is a very interesting way of looking at things because you're learning on a group basis but very individually. I think that's a really good mix. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've really enjoyed it. And it's also a very nice thing. I mean, I don't... When, when we were sort of in younger classes, I remember it was always the first thing you did in the morning. Mm -hmm. I mean, you recall what you've done the day before, so you're obviously going through it and then you move on to something new. And it was always quite a nice way to kind of start the day because it, it is quite a gentle form of learning. But, it, I mean, it's still very effective. Yeah. Yeah. Main lessons are, are really one of like, the most inspired parts of standard education. Yeah. One of the biggest problems we have at the moment is that, uh, at least the West, seems to be descending into this state where everyone needs constant gratification of little bits all the time, so constantly consuming, you know, a bit of fast food or, you know, something like the, the website Twitter. You know, we can no longer be bothered to read anything longer than 100 characters. Um, the thing about main lessons is because it's a long block of doing one thing, it, um, it really uh, develops your, your ability to, to kind of absorb and actually immerse yourself in something rather than just needing it instantly in a bite-sized piece. You, you have time to, uh, time to uh, digest it, I suppose. Michael Hall, like nearly all Waldorf schools in Britain and America, is a private fee-paying school thereby putting it out of the reach of most children, not at all what Steiner would have wished. In most of continental Europe, Waldorf schools receive government support. Now, in the UK, there are moves to change the situation. Government funding, so far without unacceptable strings attached, is coming the way of what used to be the Hereford Waldorf School, founded in 1983, and now, since 2008, the Steiner Academy Hereford. One government stipulation was that the school had a principal. Traditionally, Waldorf schools are run collectively by a college of teachers. Here, the principal, Trevor Mepham, who has been connected to Waldorf education for 25 years, is supported by his deputy, Clarence Harvey, who came from mainstream secondary education in Liverpool. I asked Clarence what drew him to a Waldorf school. Uh, that's a long story. <laughs> Um, I suppose essentially uh, I believe in what it's trying to do. Yeah. Um, that there is something missing, that's my experience, there's something missing in mainstream education. And I have been aware of Steiner education for many, many years through my professional training and experience and so on. And um, I suppose I recognize in it uh, the possibility of something different emerging.
So I was very drawn to helping that to happen. What, what, what would be different then? In a word? Yes, you, you no, <laughs> in, I mean, in a what, word, yeah. In a word, what's different is yeah. that um, I think this education makes it central that we're dealing with the children and who they are and who they can be rather than with external demands of society. External demands of society are important, but it has to start with who the children in their deep selves, who they are. So for me, that's, that was an exciting um, and important thing to, to help support happen. Is it possible in, in schools, in publicly funding, funded schools with all the accountability, to not lose sight of the children? Yeah. So, yeah. What would you say, Trevor, would the essence then? Well, I think there's an awful lot of talk uh, in these times about technology, globalisation, speed, variety, all of those things. And a, a lot of it is packaging. A lot of it is um, stuff that's on the surface. But I think, uh, echoing what... Clarence just said, I, I think there's a, a really important need not to bring about globalization of the world, but to bring about humanization of the world. The Washington Carver School near Sacramento in California, one of nearly 5,000 charter schools throughout the USA, and like the Steiner Academy Hereford, publicly funded and free to students, but independently operated. The head, Allegra Alessandri, is gradually introducing Waldorf methods into what was one of California's most persistently failing schools. A further 20 charter schools in California alone are likewise bringing some of Steiner's educational ideas to youngsters for whom fee-paying schools are out of the question. I asked Allegra how the pupils and their families have reacted to her initiatives. Is there resistance or do they respond? Well, because we are a school of choice, students opt out of their large comprehensive high school to come here. So they're making a choice to be here. And mostly what we hear the majority of the time is, why didn't I find this sooner? We have students who are very creative and artistic, who have been um, really languishing in the system, who have been failing in the system, and yet are very bright students with enormous talents. And um, they come here and find a place to flourish because we do because they are developing and growing, and that's recognized. The compromises that inevitably arise when Waldorf methods are introduced into mainstream education are a problem for some Steiner purists. But it seems to me, on a visit to a school like this one, that Steiner would be delighted that people are experimenting and moving beyond the borders of a movement that can all too easily become inward-looking and even elitist. And perhaps most important of all, Allegra and her team are making an important contribution towards helping and encouraging less fortunate young people. I asked her what it was like when she first took over. Uh, there was gang activity. We called the police two, three times a day. We had regular drug busts. We confiscated um, many, many ounces of marijuana over the school year. Uh, we had many fights that we were breaking up in classrooms, outside of classrooms. There were maybe two or three thefts a day. Yeah. Allegra used the word process to describe what is happening at her school. Not yet a full Waldorf curriculum in place, but they now have a choir, a garden, fruit trees have been planted, 
Waldorf-trained teachers are gradually joining her, and fighting is a much more skilled and disciplined affair. Rudolf Steiner never visited America, but he did travel extensively in Europe during the last 20 years or so of his life, delivering over 6,000 lectures, as well as writing books, plays, and a collection of meditative verses. Walter Kugler is in charge of the archive related to Steiner's work up until his death in 1925. It's housed in the basement of this building, across the meadow from the Goetheanum in Switzerland, the center of the anthroposophical society that Steiner founded. It replaced an earlier wooden building which Steiner designed and worked on with an international group of helpers for nearly eight years, and which was destroyed by fire on New Year's Eve in 1922. Steiner drew up plans for the replacement, this time made not out of wood, but of concrete but he never lived to see its completion. What did survive the fire was this huge carving which Steiner created along with the English sculptor Edith Marion and known as the group. Steiner referred to the central figure as the representative human being. In some people's eyes, it's an imagination of what St. Paul proclaimed, not I, but the Christ in me. The carving is also a depiction of the two polarities that Steiner saw as key ingredients at work in human nature. One that he identified as Lucifer is the influence that gives us our sense of self, independence and creative potential. But if taken to extreme, leads to pride, selfishness and a flight from our tasks on earth. The other influence, Steiner called this being Ariman, is what helps us to keep our feet on the ground and to live in the here and now. But again, if taken to extreme, encourages us to believe that only what can be weighed, counted and measured is real. All else is fantasy. Our task is to hold these two polarities in balance. And Steiner didn't leave out the role of humour on this arduous journey. Jung would have called Lucifer and Araman archetypes. For Steiner, they were actual beings, beings like us, caught up in a mighty evolutionary drama, and a drama that is unfolding not just in the heavens, but throughout human history here on Earth. It's a drama that has consequence for the spiritual world, um, and it is, uh, not, it is not just a a kind of forgettable backdrop to what really counts. It's not something simply to transcend as a uh, as Maya, as uh, as an illusion, uh, as something that you want to get out of in order to go to heaven uh, and avoid hell or something like that. He has much more the sense that um, human evolution and human history are part of a grand spiritual drama that. Uh, transcendent, you know, beings and forces and realities are attending to and are in some sense uh, uh, participating in and are interested in the consequences of. That's, that's extraordinary. But in these last years of his life, Steiner was not only occupied with his visions of cosmic and human evolution, and with the creation of new architectural and sculptural forms, inspiring artists such as Kandinsky and Joseph Boyce. Despite problems with his health, he continued to travel, here on a visit to North Wales in 1923. By then, he was increasingly concerned about the situation emerging in the aftermath of the First World War, politically, socially, and economically. He feels that humanity is in a great battle. And he's trying to help, try, really trying to save, save evolution from the dead end. 
or one-sidedness. One-sidedness is a dead end. If it's unbalanced, it will, it will break, it will crash, and it will bring terrible suffering. Well, see, Steiner feels we have already been through terrible suffering. There is terrible suffering in the world, cruelty. People, you know, starving, that's an unbalance. So he's very interested in economics and in the proper way for a, a government and a community to, to form in order to uh, s really to save people from, from starvation and also from meaningless work. Great, great concern. He's not a Marxist, but he drank from that cup. He knew that M Marx's critique of capitalism has some profound truth to it. It's a cruel system. Totalitarianism is also cruel. We haven't found an uncruel system, but that's what he was looking for, where the, the, uh, the economic, the political, and then the whole cultural sphere would work collaboratively in their respective spheres without anyone taking over the other. But in the West, but particularly in the United States, the economic, of course, is just far more powerful than the other spheres, controlling education, even religion. This is, for him, this is a great, great concern. Economics points to banking. And the concern expressed by Steiner nearly 100 years ago and echoed by Robert McDermott that the economic sphere has got too big for its boots has increasingly become the concern of many. Here in London, at the client day of the UK branch of the Dutch-based Triodos Bank, are both customers and bankers who are trying to work in a different way with money. Greater transparency, greater responsibility, and greater consciousness of how the money deposited is actually used. Peter Blom is chairman of the executive board of Triodos Bank. I'm convinced that banks should look more at what is really needed in society and then make out of that a feasible business. And then you need some profit, of course. You cannot do without profit, but you don't start with profit. Profit is the result. And I think that was also something what relates strongly to what Simon always said. Uh, profit is not something you aim for. Profit is something what is a sign of a healthy operation. It, it's emerging from a healthy transaction. And that is a much better way of looking at profit than s putting it there as a goal, as an objective, and make everything work for that goal. With Steiner, he always had the human being in the back of his mind when he was talking about economics, about medicine or whatever. And that is an important element what, what we can learn about because most of the thinking now, we exclude the human being. It's about the system and the human being should fit into the system. And what he did is was saying, well, let's take each human being as a starting point. Let's design something around that, what can work to serve human beings. And that deeper principle, I think, is quite important. And you cannot achieve that by just copying what he has said or just repeat what he has said. I think that's the challenge, maybe not so much for him, but for us to work with what he has brought to us. What Steiner brought was frequently in response to questions and to requests from individuals or professional groups, teachers, farmers, priests, artists and doctors. In April 1921, he gave a three-week lecture course for a group of medical practitioners in Dornach, his base in Switzerland, during which he gave the first detailed and systematic introduction to anthroposophic medicine, and also spoke about mistletoe as a remedy for cancer. The essence of all such gatherings was the quest for a deeper understanding of the human being, without which, said Steiner, it has actually become impossible to investigate the true nature of health and disease. Steiner worked closely with the Dutch doctor Ita Wegman in bringing his insights about health and disease into practical application. 
at the Hiskia Institute in nearby Arlesheim, research into the use of mistletoe as a treatment for cancer continues. Into this high-tech machine, the sap from mistletoe, harvested in June, is mixed with the sap from a second harvest in winter. The rotating discs revolving at an incredible 10,000 cycles per minute, a velocity of 1,600 kilometers per hour. One of the doctors had described to me how mistletoe, this semi-parasitic plant with no inclination to be a proper plant, with roots in the earth and a normal flowering process, could be seen as somehow held back in an embryonic way. To me, this exposure of the saps to such gravitational forces, I mean, 50,000 G forces, yes. is, is like a huge wake-up call to a mistletoe potential, bringing it to earth by exposing it to these gravitational um, forces. And that seems the key to unlocking the potential of the mistletoe for the treatment of cancer, unlocking it by bringing it to gravity. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just another way of yeah, my, yes. my way of describing that's it. Because that, that was, I think, behind Steiner's um, uh, attempt, unlock potential. Yeah. The mistletoe is a hidden plant until it becomes unlocked in this way, in the manufacturing process and then in clinical practice. Yeah. I asked the director at Hiskia about this strange combination of highly sophisticated technology with a plant one associates with druids and folklore. Yeah, the combination is strange. This old, huge, old mystical plant and this high-tech procedure. But, you know, these are polarities which maybe yeah. give sense. Mm. Yeah. Which may be taken as a, as a feature, yeah. as a characteristic of anthroposophic medicine. Yeah. Both trying to span the understanding based on old traditionally um, tradition, traditional insights, but accompanied now with the rigor of modern natural science and bringing it down to literally to earth and gravity. Outside the institute, the botanist at Hiskia showed me an example of mistletoe growing in an oak tree, describing what he called its anti-tendency to all the normal processes of plant growth. It has a very strong reduced shoot growth. Every season you have only one stem and two leaves and no more leaves. And the next season they will open the flower and in the end of the season the berries will ripen. So it has a very strongly reduced shoot growth. And through that, that's what Steiner pointed out, it is, uh, it is collecting forces, powers, and as we know today, also building up substances which have a potential in the cancer therapy. Because, mm. Morris, I mean, you're, you're a doctor. You use this mistletoe. What, 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 what actually is it doing? It's not a cure for cancer, is it? Steiner introduced it in... 1921 publicly in one of his lectures as a, a potential um, medicament that could help cancer treatment. Um, not, as you said, necessarily as a cure, but research has shown there have been many cases collected already where cancer with mistletoe treatment alone can have quite a powerful effect and some, some patients even go into remission. Mostly, over the last um, research has shown, and Hamut already indicated, the substances have been looked at and studied in great detail now. And more is now understood of why, why this may be the case, why it may be a helpful remedy. Why, why is it? Well, it, it's something to do with um, its peculiar botanical properties and the very unique composition of substances inside and the most studied substances I mean there are the hundreds of different substances inside but the most that have been studied and are understood are the lectins and the viscotoxins two substances that seem to have a direct impact on the cancer and equally important an impact on the immunity the, the, the patient's immunity the possibility of one's own natural forces to deal with and to an extent deal um, overcome come cancerous processes yeah. pollution stress 
illness. How can we find the ability to muster inner forces in the healing process, or simply to cope with modern life? An ally in this challenge is Velida UK, here on the outskirts of Ilkeston in Derbyshire. Founded in 1921 as a result of Steiner's contact with the medical profession, Valida is now a worldwide organization providing medicines that stimulate our natural capacity to heal ourselves and to remain healthy. It also creates products which, in Valida's words, restore harmony and enhance well-being. Alongside its modern and efficient production line, many of the substances are potentized by hand, enhancing, so they believe, the efficacy of the medicines. The managing director is Bob Ballard. I think there's a general uh, disillusionment with the uh, one-size-fits-all uh, standardization, normalization. Um, and I think there's a greater awareness of people's own responsibilities for their own actions and their own, in our business, health and well-being, yeah. There's so many uh, side effects uh, with um, uh, a lot of the conventional medicines, not all, but there's a, there's, there's a lot of side effects um, because of this one-dimensional view of the human being, you know, as a, as a machine, and if... Uh, something breaks, you just fix it, yeah, um, uh, without a, a total awareness of what's the implications of that on the rest of the, uh, the body, yeah. yeah. On well, our mind, on spirit, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The plants that are used in the majority of Velida's remedies are grown in their own biodynamic garden. The space is deliberately not all geared to production, but to the health and diversity of the environment as a whole a pond, meadow, and trees. For Michael Bate and his assistant, Claire Hattersley, the plants, all plants, mirror aspects of the human being, and, if recognized, are there to restore balance and to heal. The medicines which Rudolf Steiner himself gave us are very fascinating, and, and when you really study the growth and gestures of the plants that he suggested, they can provide this picture often of the healthy working of, say, the heart or the liver or, or whatever, or, on the other hand, provide a mirror of, of how the, that organ or that system doesn't work. This commitment to ponder deeply on Steiner's sometimes challenging indications about our relationship to nature and to our interconnectedness with nature, and to observe what the plant is saying to us, is at the heart of Valida's work. Michael also spoke to me about the challenge of being as fluid and flexible as nature herself, and to recognize that everything, including our own lives, is in process. Nothing is fixed. And like each one of us, every plant has its own unique signature. We have some plants here that they, all, they almost push us away. They don't really want us to interfere too much with the way they grow. They don't really want to respond to us gardening and cultivating them. They would rather be standalone. And there are other medicinal plants that are quite kind of... They don't change too much if we are weeding them and hoeing them. And you get a sense that they are working with us but there are certain plants that are much more independent and if we start to fuss them too much then they're perhaps not yeah, so happy like it, yeah yes. so we have to respect that as well what's your understanding what's the definition of a weed then a plant in the wrong place <laughs> <laughs> um I see weeds very differently now since I've worked at Weed. Something that's very difficult to grow if you want to. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Quite often the yeah, plants, the, yeah, the they plants do we're trying like, to cultivate, yeah. <clears throat> sometimes they just turn their nose up. They won't behave themselves like garden plants. They're not predictable. So we'll sow, the, sow a bed of something, maybe poppies, and they won't come up. But maybe in three years' time <laughs> they'll come up for us. So we have to be a little bit kind of flexible. I think your plants sound to me more and more like people. Yes, <laughs> yes they are. Yes. 
people, their health and well-being are the prime concern of the Blackthorn Medical Centre at Maidstone in Kent, an NHS practice that combines conventional medicine with an anthroposophical approach to health and healing. It also offers therapies that include eurythmy, biographical counselling, rhythmic massage and art. In addition, the Blackthorn Trust has a contract with social services for the rehabilitation of patients with mental health problems through work in Blackthorn's garden, bakery, cafe and craft workshop. The practice also has NHS funding for their work on pain management. David McGavin, like all good doctors, is enthusiastic about helping people who, for various reasons, feel themselves at the end of the road. Sometimes only then can the healing begin. And that's what we have to do. And that's what is such, such fun doing. Because the human being is so resourceful, there is so much talent there. People come in feeling that they are so shallow. They come in feeling that they are nobody because of the way they've been treated, because of the way they've been reduced, because they have nothing now in terms of income. They've lost their car, they're on benefits. They feel they're that big. They've no idea, until they start working, of the depths of their humanity. Others see it. Those who love them see it. But they've lost the sense of that. The body is not a machine. It's filled with wonders and abilities of which the conscious human being is using a fraction. And it's in these circumstances of chronic pain, in a way the torture of the illness, with no material way of getting out of it, that one is thrown into this mysterious world. And to have uh, Rudolf Steiner's maps, as it were, Here's a great help. The Goetheanum in Switzerland, location for the annual International Medical Conference for Anthroposophical Practitioners, at which David McGavin is one of the speakers. And the latest plan, because we have plans every two or three years, is that the money will now go to doctors, and we will have all the money. We have chosen patients who are not just difficult, but difficult to treat. And so we all fight with each other because we all know best. But with these patients, they are so difficult, we all needed each other. And if you have a big problem and you don't know what to do, they become very interested in you. If you want to try, you only have to try. These are weak at the center. One must look for strength. And the whole thing goes into a very, very expensive form of amusement. Everybody wants more. And this is a real problem. And I think our medicine is one of the very few, if not the only medicine, that can take patients into independence because we recognize the presence of the ego. There are nearly 3,000 doctors worldwide who've taken the additional training in anthroposophic medicine. Alongside an increasing number of hospitals, clinics and surgeries offering treatments informed by and developed from Rudolf Steiner's indications. Ursula Flatters qualified as a doctor in her native Germany, but has worked in Sweden for 30 years and was a co-founder of the Vida Clinic in Jana. I asked her what she felt was Steiner's most significant contribution to medicine. It's very much. <laughs> Maybe the most important thing is that you need to integrate every illness into the biography of a human being. It means the illness has a context and that has big moral consequences. You have to treat everybody individually, you have to listen to everybody, you have to find out what is the possibility in this situation for the individual patient, maybe this is the strongest thing. Yeah, yeah. 
that inspired me most and and really deeply changed my relationship to the patients and my decision making. So each person has a story in a way, that's what you're saying. Yes, yeah? yes, and the story is sometimes a secret story even for the patient. So when you get ill, something is like a secret. There's something in it that we both have to find out. Steiner said everybody has a mission, a mission, not only the big person on the platform. Everybody has a mission that also means he has a task in this life. So this kind of feeling for biographies as a period of time in which we come with task and we work for this task and we go with the results and bring the results in in the future evolution of ourselves, but also of humanity. <coughs> Michaela Glöckler worked as a pediatrician in Germany before becoming head of the medical section at the Goethe Arnhem. Steiner's concept of spirituality is that every human thought is a spiritual power. That what you think will be reality of tomorrow. That thinking is not just a cloudy thing. That thinking is the driver of evolution. So if you have this concept, thinking is the spiritual power and is also life. Then you understand psychosomatics, why thinking can heal, why meditation is healthy, why bad thoughts are affecting people. You do not know this only, you understand and you can also work with that concretely in healing, in concepts. But also when you have remedies from nature, minerals, plants, healing plants, you understand the spirit, you understand the effect also on the consciousness, on various parts of the body. So we study very concretely, very scientific, what works in the nature and corresponds with nature processes in our physical nature. And on the other hand, what can we contribute by helping the people to live more consciously, more meaningful, more healthily in all their various life circumstances. Michael Evans is a general practitioner from England who also runs regular courses in anthroposophic medicine for doctors in the UK and in India and the Philippines. I think what's unique about Steiner's contribution is that um, on the one hand he fully recognized what conventional medicine was offering as a detailed knowledge of the physical body but made it very clear and almost challenged doctors to think beyond the box and to be aware that the human being has life forces, has a soul, has a spiritual identity and that all that is part of being human and really all that is involved in the process of becoming ill and potentially can be um, mobilized in, in the healing process. Karina Zella is from Argentina and works as a doctor in Chile. I was always very interested in spirituality and I had the experience um, both the science and the sp in spirituality are truth and both are truth but I can't find the bridge and there has to be a bridge so, science and spirituality yeah, yeah because I was always very interested in science too and uh, I was I was uh, searching looking for the bridge and I couldn't find it and um, I read a book of Rudolf Steiner in Ita Wegmann and I said, here is the bridge that I'm looking for. Are you optimistic about the future and medicine? 
One of the things that people have said about anthroposophic medicine is that it's the, me the medicine for tomorrow. I suspect it's the medicine for the day after to tomorrow. So it needs really a, a long, the long view. So I'm optimistic in the long view. Um, not quite so optimistic in, in, the, in the short term. Do you see an element of tragedy in Steiner's life? The fact that he did die quite early? Holy. Yes. Certainly, I think the whole life is, uh, uh, from one point of view, it's a tragedy. I think he was suffering a very lot. Because? Be because he, I think his insights were so far reaching that he didn't meet enough people to understand quick enough. But from another point of view, you can say love is always a tragedy. You come with something really new. It was really a, an impulse of love, I think. So it must fail in a way. To begin with, looks like that because he 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 was not the big star. He connected to people. He wanted to work with people. He took them as they were. He was positive, and all this very big social impulse is it's great. Maybe it's a little bit more slow for him, but we all are invited to this, and that is not a tragedy. I think that's beautiful. It takes some time, but it's beautiful that he chose that. He could have gone to the mountains and wrote a lot of wonderful books, but he chose to work together with people. And it's very great. I, I don't know anything else that is so practical, that really tries to to create a culture from spiritual insights, not only having them, but doing something. But things are going much slower when they, than one would wish. Even in me, I'm too slow, I'm too lazy. <laughs> Slowly but surely might be one way to describe the progress of Rudolf Steiner's legacy, not only in medicine, but in all areas of daily life. He died nearly 100 years ago, on March the 30th, 1925. During his lifetime, he frequently spoke about death, and in particular about the bond that continues between those of us on Earth and those who are no longer physically present. And to the extent that we are open and aware of those we have known and loved, so can they continue to help and inspire us. And we, in our turn, can communicate to them insights and experiences that can only be learned in the here and now. The essence of his message, as I understand it, a message that tries to communicate ancient wisdom in a form appropriate for modern consciousness is that there is only one world, part seemingly hidden, part revealed, and that we human beings are not alone, not just in our daily lives, but in the universe at large. <laughs> 